Good morning. My name is Maria Grusma, and I'm a moderator of this webinar, The Changing Arctics, to celebrate 100 years of uh, diplomatic relations between Estonia and Norway, and dedicated to Arctic research from both Estonian and Norwegian time. To be fair, I still haven't used to see current reality having those seminars alone in the room. I'm actually right now almost alone in a big room, wonderful building of Estonian Academy of Science, where I would very much like to host you all, have coffee breaks together, informal chats, talk about past, talk about future, all sort of plans we and, and, and fun things we could do together and ins interesting and important problems that we could solve together. But um, I'm afraid this is not going to happen for some time yet. However, my suggestion is that while we are forced to have this sort of a format, we take best out of the formats that we have. I therefore encourage all the participants to actively participate, whatever you mean active. Um, but try to exploit all the possibilities in terms of the forum, ask questions, have discussions. Um, also, it's always possible to change ideas directly with other uh, presenters. Uh, you can ask them directly if you can't find their contacts and, and later on you get some good ideas. You're very welcome to contact me personally or find contracts through the Estonian Academy of Science or through the uh, embassies in Estonia and Norway. Uh, whenever you think that you have an idea worth exploring, you need some information, you're missing data, uh, you want to uh, form a consortium or whatever, and so don't hesitate to contact us through all sort of channels, diplomatic or not. So after all, we researchers are very good in building international corporations and we've proven it through history, being really good at doing it also during difficult times. So Arctic, although this is changing, it has been there pre-COVID, and Arctic definitely is going to be there post-COVID. So it's kind of comforting. There is something that is still remaining. Also, we're gonna talking today about changes in Arctics. Arctic research, polar researchers will always be there, so they will be always needed. And let's take that message to actively participate and contribute to investigate this fascinating region of the planet. I would now like to give the floor over to the uh, president of Estonian Academy of Science, Professor Tarmo Sommer. Tarmo is himself actually a uh, oceanographer, a researcher who is um, used to look at large global processes and look at the planet as a whole. And as such, I'm very glad he's a perf uh, perfect person to um, take over the floor and uh, give you the welcome. Thank you, Maria. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to take over uh, the floor, actually now the screen, from the hands of the fellow member of the Estonian Academy of Sciences, Professor Kruzma, alias the member of the group of chief scientists, chief science advisors to the European Commission, and then hand over the screen uh, in less than 10 minutes to the ambassador of Norway, the Foreign Ministry of Estonia, and the Secretary of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm very thankful to the drivers and, and the organizers of this event, the colleagues in the Academia Europea, Bergen Knowledge Hub, Bergen Center for Climate Research, University of Bergen, and of course, Tallinn University of Technology. Uh, these efforts uh, uh, recognize and amplify the core perception of uh, many experts, namely that 
the Arctic is a place that holds the key for understanding and mitigation of climate change in the entire world. We of course know that there is global warming, but and the global warming is quite substantial. So the average temperature of the Earth has increased by almost a degree uh, since <coughs> uh, after the uh, 1950s. But the warming is not homogeneous. If we look at the map, then we see that Donald Trump may have been right in some aspects. There is sometimes cooling in North America and uh, in some other places of the world. But totally, we see that everything is becoming more and more red. The forerunner here is the Arctic. In this um, perspective and in, in these coordinates, we see that the Arctic is warming up much faster, two to three times faster than any other area of our Earth. And if we look in, in a third perspective, how rapid is the increase in temperature in Arctic, then we see that it is really massive. What, when um, in average the temperature has increased by approximately 0 0.8 degrees, then in Arctic it's 2.5 up to 3 degrees. An implication, not saying ramification of that, is that the ice cover in the Arctic has quite substantially decreased. While in the uh, 18 1980s, there was quite some ice, then the summer ice coverage has been decreasing gradually and by a factor of two or three uh, at the recent time compared to the time um, uh, 40 years ago. Why cold is important? It might be a strange question, but if we look at the deep chasm of the ocean, we see their oxygen-based life. This is not a natural process. Um, oxygen cannot really penetrate to the deeps of ocean um, via, via uh, just uh, spreading all over the water column the, of the ocean. And it can't penetrate so easily to the deeps simply because uh, there is not much uh, water exchange between, between the upper layer, which is normally warm and light, and the bottom layers, which are normally much colder and having larger density. There are just a couple of places in the world where, the, where this kind of convection uh, is possible. And those places are one of them near to our countries between Europe and, and, and Greenland, and other places near Antarctic. And this is the pump which supplies oxygen to the rest of the ocean deeps. The other thing, the other uh, side of this coin is so-called uh, Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which is a massive heat pump which transports heat to the north and cold to the south in the bottom layers. It, some people say that this is actually the highway of life in the entire Earth. There has been uh, many disasters to the life um, in the past. One of the largest disasters, the greatest dying, happened about 252 million years ago, and this is called Great Dying. Its duration was very short in geolo geological time scale. One of the hypotheses for, um, of the mechanisms which may have caused it was that this pump or conveyor belt was stopped. So underwater methane was released and the entire ocean was in hypoxia or in anoxia. It was worse than nuclear war because even insects didn't survive. Even though this hypothesis has not been proved, it still leads us to some conjectures. One which is sort of complicated conjecture is that the well-known possible weakening 
of the Gulf Stream, the surface current, is actually a local problem. But we shall have a global problem if this conveyor belt or Atlantic meridional overturning circulation would stop. And this transport is at its weakest level over the last 1600 years. So if we are searching the key for those changes to understand what happens with the climate, what complications, what ramifications would the climate change have, then, then the key lies in the polar areas, pretty much in the Arctic, Arctic and possibly less in the Antarctic. Those areas are almost inaccessible. They have extremely harsh conditions. There is very limited data about situation in those areas, which means that we don't have enough information to really run the models. But now referring to Professor Kruzma, we should measure specifically in those locations for which the information is missing or limited. Otherwise we are searching in the wrong place. So we should understand how much ice we have, how much we should have it to keep the life in ocean deeps still living. How the perma, perma frost, frost is melting, how the methane emission goes, etc., etc. Even such a simple thing, the warming in the Arctic means that the shores will be not simply eroded, they will, will be melting etc etc perhaps i'm a little bit only a little bit over exaggerating by saying that if there will be no more cold winters in the arctic the entire world may stop i think that world will not stop and we have a role in this non stopping of the earth so i'm wishing a successful day for for the organizers, presenters, and guests of the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tarmo, for, um, well, for not sad, encouraging introduction, but this is what we have, right? And we have to deal it with the problems that we have, no sugarcoating. So that's actually a nice uh, introduction to, to the whole, uh, seminar. We're dealing, we're dealing with difficult problems, so let's co get on with them. Um, I can see there are questions for uh, the presenter, but um, unfortunately I cannot see them on a screen at the moment. So Tarma, if you are here for a while, um, maybe they will be uh, uh, displayed. No, there are no questions yet. My bad. Uh, uh, but now I would like to give a floor over to the ambassador of Norway in Estonia, Else Berit Eikland, uh, for another opening speech, uh, giving us more information about what is happening in Arctic and why we should research that together. Dear friends, chers venner, Good morning from this fantastic uh, building, uh, the Estonian Academy of Science, with a foggy view of Tallinn. And we are three of us here, so we will have the conference, drinking coffee, and thinking about all of you in Tallinn, in Tartu, in Longyearbyen, in Tromsø, Bergen, Trondheim, and at your kitchen table. This seminar is part of the celebration of the 100 years of diplomatic relations between Estonia and Norway, established in February 1921. We are looking at the past and also at the future. Why is the Arctic so important to Norway that every embassy, Norwegian embassy all over the world is having an Arctic program. What is it about Arctic? Well, Norway and Estonia are both maritime countries and with a long history of polar exploration and research. 
In many ways, we have a parallel history. We are both young states, Norway with independence in 1905 and Estonia in 1918. For Norway, being a poor country at the outskirts of Europe, there was a, a wish and a need to, to develop a national identity, a story about this nation. What made us different from our neighbors? Why should Norway be an independent state? Of course, what really mattered for Norway was the nature, the ocean, and also the polar explorations that had been going on long, long time before independence. So the most important photo in Norwegian history is probably the one of Amundsen and his team of four at the South Pole in December 1911. This small, new, newly independent state won the race to the South Pole. Norwegians celebrated. We were a nation, and we are still celebrating. And I think that the polar issues, the research, the focus on polar identity and history, our love for winter sports, and also our love for this loneliness and to really to, to try to, to, to do our best in snow and storm are all part of this national identity. And living here in Estonia, I can recognize some of the same identity here. So what we're talking about is really the ID mark of a nation and maybe also the Estonian ID mark as a polar nation. Today, we will focus on the future, on the science. I will not try to do a diplomatic presentation about climate change in the Arctic when I have Estonia and Norway's leading scientists. But I will just, uh, just say that we need more international cooperation in the Arctic. We need more Estonia and Norway. And that's why this first webinar on science cooperation is so important for the embassy and for Norwegian interests here in Estonia. I want to thank the um, Estonian Academy of Science, Tallinn University of Technology, the Birkner Center for Climate Research, University of Bergen, for doing this seminar, for preparing this seminar. But most of all, I want to thank two persons, because without these persons and behind institutions, there have to be these personalities, these drivers who want to do things. And in this case, we have two. One of them is here <laughs> today, uh, Rhein uh, Weikmer, and also present in Bergen, Eistan Janssen. Thank you so much for preparing the seminar, for being the drivers, and we promise to follow up in cooperation with you. I had planned to invite you all to the fabulous Norwegian residence in Nome and to celebrate this new polar relationship, or well, not new, but a continuity and maybe a strengthening polar relationship between Estonia and Norway. We will wait until the COVID situation is better. But instead, I want to invite you to two Arctic exhibitions here in Tallinn. Uh, and I want to send greetings from our friend and partner, the Estonian Polo Club. So the first exhibition is at the Tallinn, um, 
Tallinn University Academic Library, and it's about Estonian books and art objects from the Arctic. And of course, Amundsen and Ansen in Estonian are were very popular in Estonia, and I still think have a following here. Also, a copy of the Fram ship will be exhibited. The next exhibition may be even more relevant for all of you, and that's an exhibition about Estonian uh, science and research at Svalbard from Soviet times and until today. And both the exhibitions show this long historical links of Estonian polar interest, and also, not at least for me, the strong connection and links with Norway from the beginning and until now. So thank you all. I will be here and pretend that I will be drinking coffee with all of you, and I promise that the embassy will be behind and invite, and hopefully with the Estonian Academy of Science, and invite you all to Tallinn on the next seminar in person. So thank you so much. Thank you, Elsa Perry Tusentak. It was very nice how to describe the um, common nature of Estonian and uh, Estonians and Norwegians, two nations who never had problem with social distancing. So we are perfect people to to join our forces during this time and to to um, investigate Arctics. But um, now I would like to give the, a word over to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Estonia for a short. Unfortunately, pre-recorded notice, but uh, definitely full of content. Dear moderator, honorable scientists, dear friends of Arctic in Estonia and in Norway, distinguished audience, I am truly honored to address today's first ever Estonian-Norwegian bilateral Arctic webinar. Not only is this important event part of making our common past and the centenary of establishing diplomatic relations between Estonia and Norway, but so symbolically it gives us an excellent occasion to look into the future and discuss new topical areas of cooperation such as Arctic and Arctic research. Arctic-related issues are high in both countries' agendas. Norway, as well we all know, is an Arctic coastal state and one of the eight Arctic Council members. So very much familiar with all the different aspects related to Arctic issues. Norway is also a major scientific power in the Arctic, whom Estonia is eager to learn from and cooperate with as we engage more in Arctic affairs. Estonia, as you all hopefully know, is currently applying for Arctic Council observer status in order to do its share for it, the sustainable development in the Arctic. Ladies and gentlemen, concern over challenges facing the Arctic is mutual, so science and scientific cooperation is rightly the topic of today's webinar. I am very glad Estonian and Norwegian scientists are already working to projects such as the Arctic Institute of Geolo Geology and Norwegian Polar Institute on ice core drilling on Svalbard and sample analysis. Our Professor Maria Guzma's joint project with the University of Oslo, so-called Mamma Mia, on mechanisms of causing ice acceleration, to name a few. Scientists are on the front line monitoring, making sense and analyzing the rapid changes happening in the Arctic. The message from them is clear. Climate change is the challenge of our time, and nowhere is this more evident than in the Arctic. Scientists also send us another clear message. Only through joint action and international cooperation can we hope to gather sufficient data to keep pace with the changes in the Arctic and adapt to them. The task for all countries who care about preserving the Arctic's vulnerable ecosystem 
is to listen to the scientists and cooperate to preserve it. I am extremely proud to say that Estonia has long traditions in Arctic, in Arctic research that are as viable as ever. Our Arctic expert community is perhaps not comparable to those of the Arctic states, but quoting Estonian president, Gersti Kailulaid, Estonia poses this polar research expertise every small country ha can be proud of. End of the quote. Let me remind here that the expertise of our scientists combined with our innovative private sector and digital solutions is the core of our Arctic Council observer application. You will surely hear more in detail during today's discussions, but just a few examples about Estonian scientists' specific knowledge where we believe lies and have potential that could add value to the work of Arctic Council. Our scientists are embracing modern technology to bring their research, tools and methods to a new level. They are working to fill data gaps and to do their share to understand the changes in the Arctic. In doing so, special attention can be given to indigenous peoples of the Arctic who have most to lose from the devastating effects of climate change in the region. Estonia has been supporting UN initiatives of, of the welfare of indigenous peoples for a long time. Their adaptation must be a priority and their distinct cultures need to be preserved as much as possible. On the other hand, they have every right to enjoy the benefits of a modern society. Combined with the expertise of our social scientists and ethnologists and with the help of digital solutions, we stand ready to engage in projects that could be useful to them. Dear friends, while the Arctic Council focuses on solving practical problems in the Arctic and providing international governance for the region, the root causes of climate change in the Arctic lie elsewhere and must be addressed on a global scale. To mitigate and adapt to climate change, the whole international community must be engaged. This is a common effort and I am very glad that Estonia and Norway already are working together on climate change issues in the United Nations Security Council. In the Nordic Baltic Aid Framework and also in the context of EU Green Deal that Norway is looking to link up to. We would like to continue this cooperation. Dear audience, you will be here you will hear today from the Estonian scientists taking the floor that Estonia has a lot to offer to the Arctic. We have a distinct set of experiences and capabilities that can be beneficial to the work of the Arctic Council. We are committed to participating in discussions about the sustainable development in the Arctic and wish to stay engaged for the long term. For the long term. It is my hope that one day Estonia and Norway will be cooperating also in the framework of Arctic Council working groups. So I very much hope that today's webinar will further facilitate bilateral Arctic cooperation between our countries and allow new contacts and collaboration, including in the scientific field. I wish a very pleasant discussion with the uh, scientists of Estonia and uh, Norway. Have a good discussion. Thank you. I will now uh, give an opportunity to another welcome speech by State Secretary Audun Halvorsen from Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Foreign Minister, Ambassadors, Organizers, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to give opening remarks at this first ever Estonian-Norwegian Arctic Science Webinar organized by the Estonian Academy of Sciences, Tallinn University of Technology, the Bjerknes Center for Climate Research, and the Bergen Knowledge Hub, in cooperation with the Norwegian Embassy in Tallinn. I am particularly pleased that this event is part of the celebration of the 100 years of diplomatic relations between Estonia and Norway. Norway and Estonia both have long-standing traditions for maritime exploration and polar research. In this regard, 
Cooperation on Arctic research is also important for adaptation to climate changes and the development of new blue-green technologies that will underpin sustainable jobs and value creation. I would like to underline that the rising temperature in the Arctic is mainly caused by the increase in greenhouse gas emissions globally, not by human activity in the region itself. This means that in order to improve the situation in the Arctic, we must set and implement global targets, and Norway intends to do its part. Norway's target for 2030 is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% and towards 55% by 2030, compared with the 1990 level. We are cooperating closely with the EU to achieve this target, and Norway shares the vision for a European Green Deal. We want to be a partner and contribute to its implementation. Norway is at the forefront in areas such as new types of ocean Arctic space and satellite activities linked to fields such as meteorology, maritime preparedness, ocean management and combating marine pollution. We also have emerging businesses in the sectors of hydrogen power, ocean wind and battery cell production. At the end of last year, the government presented a new white paper on the Arctic. The overall aim is to have a forward-leaning Arctic policy that is adapt adapted to global challenges. The white paper reaffirms Norway co Norway's commitment to international cooperation in the Arctic, based on the respect for international law and the existing multilateral framework. Ladies and gentlemen, when Estonia joined the EU and thereby the European Economic Area in 2004, the cooperation between Norway and Estonia got a renewed boost with the launch of the EEA and Norway grants. What started out with projects of biodiversity databases, energy efficiency and groundwater monitoring has now grown into a full-fledged program on climate change mitigation and adaptation with of a total of 6 million euros. This program builds on the impressive work done by Estonian universities and research institutions in cooperation with the Norwegian partners in mapping the climate change challenges in Estonia and recommending solutions. This work was a strong contribution to the Estonian government's own climate change adaptation strategy. With the webinar today, the science cooperation between Norway and Estonia for the first time addresses its use of the Arctic. We hope that the event will contribute to strengthening the science cooperation between our two countries even further. Thank you. I believe that those keynote speeches and welcoming speeches gave us a good big picture and a context for the next of our scientific uh, presentations and changes of ideas, uh, both in context of Estonian Norwegian relations, polar science, but also the global, very global context and nature of everything that happens in Arctic and in Arctic research and the implications. And now I, I have a pleasure to introduce our first speaker of a uh, research presentation, Eistin Janssen for Pierkne Center for Climate Change in Norway. And he will talk us about abrupt Arctic climate change and the Arctic research landscape in Norway. Thank you. And uh, many thanks for everybody who has been involved in setting up this um, webinar. I will just share my screen and hopefully it's now in presentation mode. So um, in 10 minutes, there's not so much one can do. And, and uh, my main aim of this is to present to the Estonian uh, colleagues elements of, of the research landscape on Arctic research and polar research in Norway. But I, I will give a very brief uh, introduction to some work that uh, we have been doing in a big EU project funded by the European Research Council um, to give some perspectives into what we are dealing with. And this uh, follows up on what was already said about climate change in, in the Arctic. It's, it's from this paper that was published last year in, in Nature Climate Change. 
on, on where we try to illustrate the ongoing uh, changes in the Arctic in the perspective of what took place in the past and uh, uh, whether Arctic climate change today can be considered as an abrupt climate change uh, on par with those that that uh, uh, we had in in the, in the past, which are some of the best studied and well known uh, abrupt climate changes. Um, uh, this shows the the um, area of highest temperature change over the last forty years over the Arctic. So the red area here is where the trend has been more than one degree change per decade. And uh, we just heard that the Arctic uh, uh, temperature change is more than twice the global mean. And in this area, and particularly north of Svalbard, it's much more than that. So, so this area, is, uh, the change has been more than four degrees and, and even more here. And if you compare to the loss of sea ice, it's primarily the area that has lost most of its sea, where the sea ice loss has been greatest, that has this very strong uh, uh, change. Um, so the question is whether this is an abrupt climate change. And uh, we compared uh, this to, to the well-known abrupt changes recorded in the Greenland ice cores. You will hear more about ice cores later. And I'll just, jump to the conclusions from this work. Um, and we find that the present Arctic climate change is an abrupt climate change and on the same scale as those of the past, even though some of the past changes and during the ice age were even faster than today. And that the, the disappearance of the sea ice cover is critical for the abruptness and also the amplitude of these changes. Uh, we also find that ocean processes and, and their impact on sea ice cover drove the transition and the rapidity. So there's an interplay between ocean circulation and sea ice. And we will hear more about this uh, uh, in the presentation from uh, Marius Autun uh, later. Uh, climate models uh, that we use to project future climate change underestimate the abruptness of ongoing warming. So, so the policy we are we we have is based on models that are underestimating uh, the abruptness of the ongoing warming. So so the reality is faster than in the models. And then we ask the question whether the ongoing Atlantification of the Eurasian Arctic may lead to a completely new Arctic. And this Atlantification will be described by Marius uh, in a later talk. So these are some of the perspectives, and you can read more about this uh, in the paper, and I'll be happy to provide it to anybody who um, can't find it in their own libraries. Then to the Arctic and polar resource landscape in Norway. Uh, you can see here that it's a large portion of the, of the work is in geosciences, um, oceanography, climate, uh, geology, and also a large portion in biology, which means uh, primarily the, uh, to a large extent oceans, but also um, land biology in the Arctic zone. But there are also elements in Norway in social sciences, in technology, physics, chemistry, and biomedicine and, and health. But biology and geosciences are the, are the primary fields. If you look at the impact or the presence of, of, of uh, the Norwegian uh, uh, Arctic and, and polar research. Uh, you can see here, this is for Norway, number of articles. Uh, the light blue is the Arctic, the dark blue is Antarctica. You can see that primarily Norwegian polar researchers focus on the Arctic, but there, there is a sizable um, Antarctic uh, contribution. Um, but if you compare with other countries, the Norwegian Arctic, uh, and the number of publications from Norwegian Arctic research is higher than big countries such as Germany, and it's number three in the world. So in terms of Arctic research, Norway is, is a major player in the world, much lar larger than our population would indicate. 
and where is this happening? Uh, and this is the number of publications in a report that was a few years back, but I think the picture is basically the same uh, uh, now. Uh, the University of Tromsø is largest in terms of its output. In terms of citations, I think the University of Bergen is uh, maybe a bit higher. But University of Tromsø, University of Bergen are, are clearly the, uh, the most active publishers of Arctic research. Then comes University of Oslo, the Norwegian Polar Institute, the University of Central on Svalbard, but the Institute of Marine Research, uh, and then the Norwegian University of, of, of Technology, Natural Sciences in Trondheim. Uh, all of uh, most of, uh, all of these institutions in blue plus others form the large uh, uh, research pro uh, project, uh, the Nansen Legacy, which I will point to in, in a little while. The funding for this research is, of course, primarily the institutional funding. But there is large funding from the Norwegian Research Council and uh, the framework programs of the European Union. Uh, all pillars of, of that go into this. Uh, then I'll mention a few large centers, and, and there are many centers, uh, and, I, and this is not an exhaustive list. It, it mentions a few of the key centers, but there are others. Uh, but time doesn't allow to go into to all of them. Uh, uh, much of the research in Tromsø, or at least a, a sizable portion of it, is 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 happening in, inside the Fram Center, which is a collaboration between twenty one partner institutions, primarily uh, located in Tromsø, with uh, wholly or partly. Um, it has seven flagship research programs on sea ice, on effects of climate change on, on, uh, on coastal areas, um, on ocean acidification and ecosystems impact in northern waters, on effects on terrestrial ecosystems, landscapes, society and peoples, uh, hazardous substances uh, and effects on, on human health, and, and uh, environmental impact of industrial uh, uh, aspects of the north. There's also now a, a new uh, emphasis on plastic in the Arctic. So these are research programs that coordinate some of the research, but of course there are lots of individual projects in addition to this at the uh, collaborating institutions. Also in Tromsø is, is CAGE, the Center for Arctic Gas Hydrate Environment and Climate. You will hear from them later as well. Uh, it's, it's a Norwegian center of excellence um, located at the University of Tromsø, uh, more than 50 staff and research areas, as we will hear later, gas hydrate and, and free gas reservoirs, role of ice ages, uh, cold loving microbes, gas in the water column, methane seepage, methane ocean acidification, and methane emissions into the atmosphere. So, so this uh, large center, which has a 10 year funding, will continue for uh, a few more years uh, until its term is, is, is over. But this is a large uh, environment directed towards the polar areas. Uh, the third I will mention is, is uh, where I, I come from myself, the Bjerkne Center for Climate Research. Um, uh, the center studies climate change past, present, and future. Um, it comprises climate researchers from the University of Bergen, about half, a bit more than half of the, of the staff, uh, from North the Norwegian Research Center, which uh, has a large climate group in, in Bergen, the Nansen Center, uh, and the Institute of Marine Research. And, and from now on, uh, most of the people from these three first partners will be co-located in this building, uh, in addition to the university's geophysical institute. Uh, the Bjerken Center has about 240 scientists from 41 countries. It, it is, was 20 years yesterday, so it, it has grown tremendously over this time. With groups in polar climate, leader for the polar climate group, 
Kirim Nizanzoglu uh, will speak later today, uh, but on global climate, on carbon system, and on climate hazards. And the center is engaged in both field laboratory work, and it coordinates the development and operation of the Norwegian Earth System Model, which is used as one of the primary models for the uh, IPCC reports. Uh, then a few examples of, of major infrastructures uh, that is used by the Norwegian community. Uh, a few years back, we were lucky to have uh, the icebreaking research vessel, uh, Kuhn Prince Håkon, uh, uh, which solved a big problem in Norwegian uh, Arctic research that we had too little capacity to go into the, to the uh, uh, into the Arctic sea ice cover with modern equipment. This is a state-of-the-art, really large uh, research vessel that now conducts research uh, 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 to a large extent. All, most of the work uh, of the Nansen legacy project is conducted on this platform. Uh, there's, in addition, a relatively large ocean-going research fleet in Norway, uh, Taylor for, for non-ice-covered waters. And of course, some of these also go into the Arctic uh, marginal ice zone or, or the subarctic regions. Um, we have a, a large uh, remotely or, uh, operated vessel, Egir, uh, which is operated out of the University of Bergen. Uh, it can go down to 6,000 meters water depth and, and does studies on the seafloor uh, for instance, related to bioprospecting or, or uh, mapping for, for um, uh, resources and understanding the, the deep uh, ocean uh, interactions with, with the ocean column. We, there's, a, there's a large atmospheric observatory near Neolusum on, on Spitsbergen, uh, the Zeppelin Air Observatory, run by the Norwegian Institute of Air Research. Uh, there is a large infrastructure in northern Norway, up here in the small map, uh, which is a cabled observatory extending out from the coast down the slope to the deep ocean with several nodes of instrumentation on it. Uh, so this is a, a relatively new uh, uh, infrastructure but very promising for lots of process studies on the seafloor. We may hear about this later also. And then lastly, uh, uh, the Norwegian Earth System model, uh, which is the global uh, climate model that is used by the uh, climate research community in Norway. Then, uh, uh, finally, I'll mention the, uh, the Nansen Legacy Project, uh, which is a huge project, the biggest by far in, in Norway in terms of Arctic research. It has uh, uh, many of the same partners, uh, as was mentioned. Uh, so most of the key Norwegian institutions involved in Arctic research are partners. Uh, this is a 50-50 uh, funding by direct funding from the government and in-kind institution funding, which of course is primarily governmental, but it comes through the different institutions. It has three pillars, uh, but the main focus is on understanding the living Barents Sea, especially the areas in the north which are ice covered, but is, are losing uh, its ice cover as uh, the global warming proceeds. It's the physical impact, it's the human impact, and also uh, estimates of what the future Barents Sea uh, will look like. And Barents Sea is, of course, a, a major uh, area for, for tapping marine resources. So, so the goals are to improve the scientific basis for management, uh, characterize human uh, impacts, the physical drivers, and the operation. Um, of the Barents Sea ecosystems, 
both past, present, and future, and develop prognostic mechanisms that govern us weather, climate, and ecosystems, so that we can predict rather than just project what will happen, and to optimize the use of emerging technologies, logistic capabilities, research, recruitment, and train a new generation of young uh, uh, polar scientists uh, in Norway. It has, of course, lots of international collaborations. And the main platform for the research is, again, uh, Kronprins Håkon. So, so this is a major uh, activity. And I think with this overview, I hope that our Estonian colleagues will see uh, areas or institutions where they could contact and build connections in the years to come. And I look forward to, to what will happen after this start of, of the collaboration. So thank you. Thank you very much, Einstein, for another scene setting talk. I just have a short question to you in a couple of words. Uh, you were mentioning several uh, trends and analysis about how polar research is done. One was a split between different disciplines in science, and the other one was a split between different countries contributing to the polar research. So the question is, what is your... Um, I don't know, facts, uh, expectations, gut feeling, is this going to change in the future when we do more polar science? Is the um, split between different disciplines of science is going to change? Or what do you think are more countries going to contribute to polar research based on your experience? Uh, what have you seen during the past years? Well, well I think polar research to a large extent has a very strong tradition of international collaboration and interdisciplinarity. Uh, this, is, this is primarily driven by the fact that it's very expensive and difficult to, to, um, to operate in the Arctic. So we are depending on pulling all resources together. So, so, um, so I think this is a trend that will just continue. And, uh, the Norwegian community is, is, has been and is very open to international collaboration. And we cannot do what we aim to do without international collaboration. So, so, so that is one trend. And the other is this interdisciplinarity. And, and the best example for this is the Nansen Legacy Project, which draws together a, a large group of people who, uh, at least to some extent, haven't worked together before. So it covers everything from social science to, to studies of the deep ocean. So, so, um, so I think this gives us lots of opportunities. And I think the people who are trained in this type of project will have a, a much less disciplinary thinking or silo thinking than, than has been traditionally. Thank you. I agree on that. So let's bring young scientists into polar research as early as possible to give them more open-mindedness. So that's maybe a takeaway from your answer to me, at least. Uh, thank you very much, Eistin, for your, uh, for your talk. Uh, I would now introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Rain Mikeman. He will give us a historic uh, introduction. That will be another scene-setting um, talk, but now looking back rather for the last 50 years of polar research in Svalbard by Estonian glaciologists. And he's our only speaker besides me who is present here in the Academy of Science. Weird. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, I'd actually like to start with uh, thanks to Ambassador Elzebert Ekeland, who actually initiated this meeting. And I guess <coughs> this is one of the best ways to celebrate this 100th anniversary of Estonian-Norwegian diplomatic relations. And when we put together this program <coughs> with my colleagues, uh, we thought this is also one event to support Estonian application to, to our uh, <coughs> observers' status in uh, Arctic Council. And therefore, we wanted to have just to give a um, 
overview on expertise, uh, expertise which Estonian scientists have in polar area and of course uh, this scope of this meeting and uh, timescale didn't allow to include all which we have but basically you will get <coughs> understanding where are uh, our expertise relays and uh, I start with a historical overview about the, our work in Svalbard. And uh, to start with this, I have to draw, draw your attention that when we started our works on Svalbard, it was middle 70s, this time we were part of the Soviet system, Soviet research system, our, also our institute was part of the Estonian Academy of Sciences and uh, uh, financing system and totally landscape, research landscape was <coughs> totally different from nowadays. And actually, but this, this was actually beginning of ice core uh, science in this time uh, in 60s high score study started and therefore for those who are not familiar what high score uh, why we are looking uh, for those studies i will give also a very short history overview this was <clears throat> one of the great names from this time uh, willy dan scored from copenhagen actually who as a student when he was graduated uh, he started to study uh, isotopes in atmospheric precipitation found that there is actually correlation and actually forwarded idea to study past climate using stable isotopes and <coughs> totally isotopes in ice cores. And uh, this was just uh, one of his <coughs> first papers he published in 70, uh, 64 and uh, when he actually showed how isotopes can show us a past climate. So isotope composition in glaciers actually uh, preserved all the history of climate. And then if we take huge ice caps like uh, in Greenland, uh, actually these are actually those uh, <coughs> three musketeers, how, how they were called, Willy Dan's court, who proposed the idea just a long way from US who provided uh, drilling techniques and Hans Oesker who actually from Bern University from Switzerland uh, put ideas how to date ice cores. And just to show on those times, 60s, when the first ice core in Kent Century in uh, Northwest uh, Greenland was drilled, technique from this time and later on I go for the more than the modern techniques will it unscored. If to look nowadays this picture it seems quite crazy because he's smoking there but all the work with ice core is very should be very clean because there is very very few actually uh, <coughs> actually contamination but but this was such a time when every, everything started only and uh, there are first isotope profiles showing climate history and actually which convinced people that this is an area where it's first while to work and develop this area. And also how looked those first station in Greenland in 73. And uh, there were continuous drillings in, in 70s in, in Greenland. And uh, in 74, we call this ice age in Estonia, which means that uh, then we started our ice core studies. Uh, we started with cooperation with our colleagues in uh, Moscow Institute of Geography, who actually had expeditions, um, glaciological expeditions on Svalbard. And when our laboratory was established, then they invited us to join and to start to do, uh, to cooperate on ice core studies on, on Svalbard. And it continues uh, through 70s and 80s. There are actually uh, pictures and actually uh, location when we <coughs> participated in ice core studies on, on Svalbard this time with um, uh, Russian colleagues and actually developed all the methods 
this was actually this time logistic helicopters to go to with our facilities to ice caps. And in 74, uh, founder of our laboratory, Professor Yamadi Puning, actually participated in first uh, drilling on uh, Grenfjord. And in 60, 76, uh, was my first uh, <coughs> drilling on, on Svalbard. And this is our drilling team. And there is in Russian uh, uh, written Krainauki, which means that Frontier of Science 76, when we first time actually drilled on uh, uh, ice core from Romanosov, which later on was uh, uh, re drilled several times. And, uh, but this first uh, data actually put uh, and get us uh, understanding that even those so called warm glaciers in Arctic. Uh, can actually give quite a lot of important information on paleoclimate, and they are actually this time logistic. And to show how the methods were developed, uh, in 79, we worked on seven assembly with our colleagues from uh, St. Petersburg Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute. They uh, uh, prepared drilling on Antarctica, but uh, they tested the drills on seven assembly. And this was a time when all the methods uh, as I mentioned, this was a deep Soviet time, and actually we didn't have actually access to <coughs> uh, international uh, journals even, but uh, still we developed uh, methods how to take samples, how to handle them, and it seems that it, it was not... Uh, actually, we were quite on right, uh, right trip, uh, right, right way. Uh, this is one picture from... Uh, Often Boston, because uh, there were several drillings in Austvorna in Svalbard and showing that Austvorna is crying. But it also marked that actually the glaciers are going to, uh, to melt. And in early 90s, we started uh, our cooperation with Norwegian Polar Institute in Tromsø. And actually, there are also, uh, this was Elizabeth Isaacson von, from Norwegian Polar Institute, to whom we worked up to nowadays and actually participated in several drillings during those years there. And there are now some results from those uh, investigations showing how the uh, temperature changes <coughs> during, uh, let's say, last uh, thousand years because, as you know, Svalbard and uh, totally Arctic, uh, on Arctic uh, islands, the glaciers are um, rather small, and actually, uh, we cannot uh, reconstruct climate history so far back, uh, like, for example, for example, in Greenland. But on the other hand, uh, Arctic glaciers, small glaciers, are very sensitive to all changes. So we can follow the changes and see you here, see how uh, you can rec <coughs> reconstruct the uh, climate, uh, let's say, little ice age on the right there, or medieval warm period of Viking times, Viking times, where temperatures were more or less the same like nowadays. And uh, studies showed that, uh, further studies that actually, even on uh, high elevations, the uh, glaciers are melting on, on Svalbard, and, uh, which is uh, important contribution to the total uh, glacial mass balance in Arctic. And also uh, chemical analysis showed how the contamination from continent, actually, especially from Europe, arrives and uh, preserves in, in Arctic glaciers. Uh, there are major places where actually uh, drillings were performed by Norwegian Polar Institute and uh, in different elevations, we still see that actually, uh, even in high elevations, melting is, is going on. And then you can see how uh, dirty and all contamination from continent actually arrives this um, Svalbard glaciers. Uh, recent years, quite a lot of uh, studies has been done on black carbon also showing the contamination, how this actually uh, is reaching the articulations. And actually, this 
uh, increase the melting. Actually, it's changing albedo, and glaciers are melting before that uh, quite intensively. Several studies uh, on the black carbon, uh, black carbon has been actually part of uh, uh, every um, uh, drilling project uh, uh, recent years on oh, sorry, sir. Uh, and this is, well, more or less the same which uh, Tarmo Sommer uh, in his introduction this morning showed how the Arctic is, is warming and actually is well known. And therefore, <clears throat> to continue research on Arctic glaciers to see how uh, uh, global warming is changing our climate is, uh, is important. And this are picture just showing if uh, remember my first slides showing the drilling techniques in early this uh, study of ice core research, this is nowadays um, EPICA program which uh, uh, EU organized in 2000, uh, actually 90s, in Antarctica. And uh, this is a modern technique also showing how high score from deep uh, drill holes uh, is actually has gotten Nowadays, actually, uh, just in this year, uh, uh, there is a new epica old ice drilling going on on Antarctica to look for ice cores which is more than a million years old. So, uh, giving us in information about the climate system, how it has changed during uh, uh, millions of time scales. And you see how this during uh, Last 60, uh, more or less 60 years, the technique, has, technique of drilling technique has developed. And uh, very briefly, to make conclusion from uh, uh, studies which uh, we together with Norwegian colleagues have <coughs> uh, uh, got in, in studies on Svalbard, it's uh, renowned that uh, warming uh, reverses long-term Arctic cooling, and uh, the warming is uh, uh, actually increasing, and also it means that uh, sea ice uh, cover is actually diminishing in Arctic, which is well known, but, but still, as Sarah mentioned several times, and Aston Janssen mentioned also, that still we have not enough data to predict what is going on in Arctic, and. Uh, we need further studies, and this especially, of course, we have to do these studies together. And uh, to conclude, I actually uh, would like to acknowledge many colleagues uh, in Norway, also in Russia and in Estonia, uh, who actually during those years have actually made these studies uh, possible also financing bodies from Norway and in Estonia. And uh, my special thanks to my colleagues Elisabeth Isaacson from uh, Norwegian Polar Institute in Tromsø, who also provided several slides for this presentation here for today. And my colleague Tenu Martma, who has been from my team, uh, I guess he's more, more or less 20 times worked in, in Svalbard. Uh, during Soviet time and also now together with our Norwegian colleagues. So with this, I conclude and I, I thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Rain, for this uh, also a scene-setting talk, in my opinion. And it was uh, nice to see that historical coverage of, um, of, uh, of the last 50 years. Uh, it looks like we don't have much excuses to do good research, because if you were able to do it 50 years ago with an equipment and clothing and everything, transport available, then uh, we should do much better. That's a good. That's a good reference. Thank you. I would now uh, introduce the next speaker, who is Marius Orthun from University of Bergen.
and he will talk about Atlantification of the Barents Sea. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak here today. Let me find my presentation. There we go. So I'm going to show you uh, some results uh, that uh, the Barents Sea has been changing uh, rapidly over the last uh, few decades changing from an uh, Arctic climate to an Atlantic climate. And this is what we refer to as an Atlantification of the Barents Sea. So I start by showing you a figure of uh, Arctic sea ice loss in winter over the last 40 years where we have good satellite data. So here blue colors meaning that you have had a, a ice loss of sea ice in, in this uh, time period. And what you see is that of all the places in the Arctic, the Barents Sea is where the main sea ice loss has been taking place. So the Barents Sea is here highlighted by the uh, red uh, square. We can also uh, look at this with a time series. So now I'm showing you the total sea ice area in the Barents Sea over in an extended time period, going back to 1920 now using uh, historical data. And what you again see is that uh, over the last few decades, there's been a clear uh, decrease of sea ice in the Barents Sea. Although you should also note that the variability from year to year is very large. So how does an, uh, this look like uh, if we uh, peek into the future uh, using a climate model? So now the black line is uh, still the observations and then the blue line is uh, from a climate model simulations. Uh, if we then uh, continue to emit uh, greenhouse gases as we are today. So you see, if we continue to emit, then uh, we expect the Barents Sea to be ice free all year round by the end of this century. If we reduce our emissions corresponding to a Paris uh, agreement, so this is shown by the red line, there is still hope that we can have some sea ice in the Barents Sea at the end of this century. So what is then causing sea ice in the Barents Sea to disappear? So one major source of uh, sea ice loss is heat into the Barents Sea uh, transported by the Norwegian Atlantic current which is the poleward extension of the Gulf Stream shown here in the map uh, to the right. And what we see is that over the last few decades, this ocean current has brought more heat into the Barents Sea, sort of extending the Atlantic domain and thus pushing the sea ice northwards. So you just repeat that. So you see that the Atlantic domain is extending uh, or eating away the Arctic domain. So again, this is why we call this an Atlantification of the Barents Sea. As the inflow of warm Atlantic water increases, the cold Arctic waters are decreasing. So the warm Atlantic waters are here shown in red uh, on top and the cold Arctic waters uh, in, in blue. And so this increase of Atlantic water um, leads to a pronounced a shift or a change in the water column structure or the stratification. So meaning that the Atlantic water, uh, which normally sits below uh, the Ar uh, Arctic water, is getting in closer contact with sea ice and then uh, are more able to melt more sea ice. So this is uh, one possible uh, feedback loop uh, in the Arctic climate system. So this might uh, lead to a, a faster retreat of, of sea ice. So the Atlantification of the Barents Sea is not only seen in a retreating uh, ice cover and warmer temperatures. So historically, the warm Atlantic water that enters in the southwest of the Barents Sea is cooled as it travels uh, through the Barents Sea and it leaves in the northeast as a cold, dense water mass. And as was mentioned this morning, this production of dense waters in, uh, in the Arctic is important for the global ocean circulation. So as the Barents Sea warms 
this production of dense waters become less efficient and the waters leaving the Barren Sea is now observed to be uh, warmer and less dense. Changes in ocean temperature and sea ice in the Barents Sea also influence the distribution of fish stocks. So if you have a warm condition, as shown here on the figure to the right as an example in 2012 versus a cold year in the, to the left in 2004, you see that in a warm condition, the cod stock, which is the red dots, uh, sort of expands northwards and become more abundant. And this is, of course, is important for, for the Norwegian uh, economy. And this um, sort of northward extension of, of fish stocks in the Barents Sea is often referred to as a borealization uh, of the Barents Sea. So again, how do we think Atlantification will continue to evolve in the future? So then we again go uh, and ask uh, a climate model uh, for advice. And what this figure on the left shows you, uh, so the different colors, is just the extent of Atlantic water in different decades going into the future. So what we find is that the climate model suggests that the warm Atlantic water will continue to spread uh, polewards in the future, um, and then uh, sort of reaching the Kara Sea in a few decades, and then the Laptev Sea, and, and so on. So that means that changes that we see today in the Barents Sea could therefore be a sign of future uh, change in the neighboring seas. So for instance, the Kara Sea in a few decades. So to better understand uh, the future Arctic Ocean, we need better observations and understanding of uh, current changes in the Barents Sea, and especially of the changes uh, that occur when going from an ice-covered Arctic conditions to uh, open water and warm Atlantic conditions, as we see in the Northern Barents Sea. So as Einstein already uh, touched upon, uh, one major project uh, right now is the um, is the Nansen legacy, where this uh, where this understanding of the new Arctic is the main uh, focus. So in this project, uh, as again Einstein alluded to, uh, we're using uh, both uh, new observations using Kunbens Hokun and 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 models to understand um, sort of the new climatic conditions when the, uh, when the um, northern Barents Sea is changing from ice covered, cold ice covered conditions to warm, more Atlantic conditions. And this includes physical, biological interactions, ecosystems, acidification, and also the development of new technology. So hopefully uh, this project will lead to lots of new knowledge about the new, um, the new Arctic. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marius, for your talk. I would take over here and um, uh, have an opportunity to talk about uh, my own research on Svalbard. Uh, the connection with Marius is that if the sea level is rising, it has to have a contributor somewhere. And the major contributor for sea level rise is the melting of glaciers. So um, in order to understand how the glaciers melt, uh, we need to understand the dynamics of how the glaciers are moving and what causes uh, the move of the glaciers. I've been working with my Norwegian colleagues for, colleagues for, I don't know, even three or four summers now on Svalbard trying to match meltwater channels in the glaciers. Um, a, a glacier is, is a huge chunk of ice. And, and when it's melting in, uh, in summer, then you observed meltwater forming channels on, a, on the top of the glacier, of the surface of the glacier. Uh, and these are called supraglacial channels. So from the top of the glacier, they are like rivers getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can observe how they are developing uh, when the sun is shining. But after a while on the surface of the glacier, 
they disappeared into Moline's hole in the glacier, and they are forming in glacial channels. So we don't know exactly what happens to the glacier, to, to the waters there, or they're going to the sea, to the to the bed of the glacier uh, between the bedrock, <coughs> excuse me, and the ice, and um, they're forming supraglacial channels. So this is really important from the dynamics of the glacier because it lubric uh, lubricates the, the base of the glacier and therefore it might contribute or not contribute to the sliding of the glacier. If we previously thought that um, glaciers move slowly um, uh, a certain amount per year, then uh, Recently, a lot of attention have became to a so-called abrupt event of surging glaciers, where suddenly the glaciers are becoming unstable. And it is speculated that one of the reasons of the glacier becoming unstable is the lubrication between the seabed, which gives the glacier a lot of uh, possibility to slide. And the more water is coming, the higher is becoming play, uh, pressure in the glaciers, uh, glacial channels, and the uh, higher pressure is also contributing to the instability of the um, uh, of the glacier. So here you also have a connection to the climate change. So warmer in the summer, the more melt uh, during the rapid melt events. You have a lot of water suddenly, and when suddenly there is a lot of water, the glaciers might get unstable. So understanding uh, how exactly the water melts inside of the glaciers is important in order to model the glaciers and predict the dynamics of the glaciers. But we have very little understanding of that. Uh, we understand the, the water movement on the surface, but in order to understand what happens inside of the glacier, we can drill boreholes, which is extremely expensive, and despite being extremely expensive, it also gives us only a point measurements at that particular point. So you're kind of also guessing whether you hit the channel or you don't hit the channel when you're boring. And there are also other techniques like ground penetrating radars and, and so forth, but they don't give you also in situ measurements from the glaciers. So our idea with, um, uh, with mapping the glaciers inside the, the um, uh, in mapping the channels inside the glacier actually again was interdisciplinary. It came from my colleague was, who was um, uh, investigating uh, pressure changes in hydropower plants and he had developed a special very rugged small sensors that he threw into hydropower plants and recorded pressures inside of the hydropower plants. So we were thinking with our colleagues that if the sensors are surviving hydropower plants, they're probably also surviving glaciers. Well, some of them do, some of them don't, but you know, uh, you're going to her about that. So the idea was to take those little drifting sensors with us, throw them inside of the channels of the glaciers, uh, and, and let them flow with the water. And why are they flowing with the water? Uh, drifting with the water, they're collecting data, continuously collecting data. Uh, so there are very few, very cheap sensors there. So the um, bottom line with those sensors is that they are deep, uh, they, um, uh, they are um, uh, cheap, and you can actually afford uh, losing quite many of them. So when uh, throwing in, into the meltwater channels, they collect. Um, uh, acceleration of the sensor and they collect pressure data, they have a magne magnetometer, so they kind of also have a reference of the uh, Earth's, uh, uh, Earth's reference frame. It knows where it uh, fares the pole is and it can put um, the data in context of the Earth's reference frame. So while this um, uh, Drifters are going, flowing with, 
with the data, they suddenly disappear somewhere and then we lose them from the site. They go inside of the glacier, but they still keep collecting data. They don't have any satellite connection, anything, just the data that we get. And finally, when we are lucky, sometimes we are lucky, sometimes we are not lucky, they come out from the other side of the glacier. So, uh, Recovery of the sensors is always the hardest part every summer. Some, in some summers we lost half of the sensors, in some summers we recovered almost all of them, but as I said, the whole idea with those um, experiments was that they're cheap enough to afford losing them every now and then. And um, after recovering them uh, comes a... Um, another uh, phase of the research, which is um, not that funny perhaps, but um, also quite elaborate and time consuming, uh, uh, analyzing the sensor data and, um, and building up the map of the englacial or supraglacial channel. Um, the idea for mapping a subsurface flow while you're not having a global reference and mapping velocities or mapping pressures is actually mathematically not straightforward at all. Uh, but my idea to do it came from my background as a roboticist. Um, in robotics, uh, especially with the robots that move, uh, the fundamental problem is to know where you are, know where you're going, and build a map of the environment. So in robotics, we've, uh, we've used to deal with that problem for decades, and we also have some uh, different methods how to tackle that problem. Uh, I have to say it's quite difficult. Quite difficult means that I had to hire a mathematician, and she was working for a year uh, to get a map like that, that you have on your screen. So on a map like that, you have the most possible, most probable paths that the drifter was taking mapped upon the pressures recording while the drifters were taking that path. So you get in 2D, in XY coordinates, in Earth's reference frame, how the supraglacial or inclacial channel is looking, but you also understand the pressure distributions inside of the glacier. Uh, for the summers we've been working, we've gradually exploring uh, longer distances, larger scales, more data. First summer we went to Svalbard, we didn't even go to Longyearby and we just stayed in, uh, um, we even didn't go to New Orleans and we just stayed in Longyearby and then played around on flocks for now on supraglacial channels to see whether we can retrieve the sensors and, and deploy the sensors. And uh, next year, we, uh, last year, we were actually already working on a marine glacier. And here are also my plans for the coming summer, if they're going to happen now. So here you can see one of the examples of what Einstein was talking about, an interdisciplinary and international project to um, uh, investigate a particular uh, event uh, on a searching glacier called, called the Jöpkul Hope. It's, uh, it's an event when you suddenly have very much meltwater going through all the channels of the glacier that may cause the instability of the glaciers. The particular glacier that you are looking at is in uh, New Olesund, near New Olesund, Kongsvägen, which is a very well uh, investigated model glacier. Uh, people have been uh, deploying different sensors to observe the motion of the glacier already from four decades. And um, an interesting uh, feature of that glacier is this little glacial lake there on the right side of the picture, Sätevatnet, uh, which suddenly somewhere in the beginning of July empties in a couple of days. So that means that all the water in the uh, lake suddenly disappears. The so water rushes through the uh, channels of the glacier and then comes out into the fjord. And nobody knows exactly where because we don't know where exactly the supraglacial channels are. 
And um, the idea with these investigations, these summaries, to actually have all hands in tech, all possible equipment that we have from here, from the ground, from boreholes, uh, from um, echo sounders, uh, bathymetry data from the boats, as well as our little sensing drifters that go through the glaciers to get an overall model how a searching glacier is behaving um, during such an extreme event. Uh, currently, as I'm speaking, I'm still not sure how do I exactly get to Svalbard uh, because Norway is quite closed, Estonia is quite closed. I still don't know whether I have to stay in quarantine or not. I know that at least after a month I have to already send my batteries to Svalbard by land, otherwise my equipment doesn't get there in time. And um, But, but I'm, I'm really hoping that Despite of the difficulties, I managed to get there and um, spend the summer investigating that interesting glacier. So that's one example of interdisciplinary international research that Einstein was mentioning and my personal, very personal experience about uh, that polar research is all about teamwork, talking to each other and talking to people from different disciplines. And um, with that, I would like to give the word over for the next speaker, uh, which is Benedict Ferrer from uh, Cage University of Troms in Norway. And he will talk about methane release and variability offshore Svalbards. And I bet this another interesting example of an interdisciplinary work. Thank you. Um, I, will, uh, I will share my uh, screen uh, now. Uh, Yes. Yes. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, today. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm Benedicte Ferré, and uh, I have a background in uh, physical oceanography, and I'm um, currently one of the group leaders at CAGE, uh, the Center for Arctic Gas Hydrates, Environment and Climate at UIT, uh, the Arctic University of uh, Norway. And uh, so today um, I will. Um, uh, present you what we generally do in CAGE, and in particular uh, what my group is doing, uh, which is um, studying the methane release and the variability, and in particular here I will uh, show you uh, what we do offshore Svalbard. Um, so first I will tell you a little bit about CAGE. Uh, so it's a center of, uh, of excellence funded uh, for 10 years by the Norwegian Research Council in uh, 2013. And uh, we are uh, located here uh, in, uh, in Tromso. Um, we are motivated by uh, the vast amount of uh, methane uh, that are trapped in permafrost and gas hydrates in the Arctic. Um, and uh, we know um, that uh, climate change affects the Arctic more than the rest of the world, that, like we saw uh, already in previous talks. And so what we want to know is, uh, um, we want to answer um, the question of what happens to these uh, reservoirs of greenhouse gas um, with increasing temperature. So in more concrete words, uh, CAGE consists in uh, different working groups, um, all working together but uh, with different focus and uh, using also diverse technology. So we have the group of uh, gas hydrates and free gas reservoir uh, using high resolution um, geophysical uh, data as well as uh, modeling. Um, we have the microbiology group uh, working on cold loving microbes and their role in uh, mediating the, um, the methane release. Uh, we have the water column group, uh, which um, I'm leading and where we study the processes uh, of um, a release and transport of methane in the water column. And we used uh, field data, uh, but also uh, observatory data. And uh, I, will, um, I will show you more uh, later on. 
And uh, this group is closely related to a former group within CAGE uh, that was led by NILU, uh, the Norwegian Institute for Air Research. But we are still um, closely uh, collaborating with them uh, in order to know um, um, he, if and how much methane is actually reaching uh, the atmosphere. The methane leakage history group uh, investigates past ocean acidification and, um, and also causes of um, past destabilization of gas hydrate systems. And they use uh, geochemical and micropyloontological markers. And uh, finally, this group uh, is investigating the role of ice ages by combining uh, marine geophysics and high resolution uh, ice sheet modeling. So now I will um, I will just show you a few um, selected results uh, from the groups um, that are published and also on the way. Um, so uh, in particular, um, here um, we repeated uh, in three consecutive years um, uh, the four transects uh, represented here in yellow uh, in the map, uh, and this might be showing the bathymetry of Georges Valbard, and we are. Uh, about 90 meter uh, depth uh, in average. And in the map, the black dots represent all the methane seeps uh, that were previously um, uh, mapped. And so in this uh, transect, uh, we measured uh, methane concentration, uh, like you can see here in, uh, in these uh, figures, uh, and it's represented in the color, um, the color scale. And on top of those um, uh, graphs, you have also the density lines uh, that sort of represent the stratification in the water column and the, the white lines. Um, so um, in particular, the results uh, showed that the methane content is more controlled by seepage intensity or, or, the, or the strength and the horizontal current uh, than by stratification like it was um, previously um, shown uh, several times. Um, and you see here, for example, uh, in May, um, that uh, the water column wa was um, very homogeneous. You see uh, there's no uh, horizontal line in the density, and yet uh, the methane was not reaching uh, the surface that much. Um, and, uh, and something else that the study showed was that uh, the eddies play uh, a key role in uh, transporting uh, and uh, spreading the, uh, the methane in the water column. Um, in this study, we compared different methane activity and fluxes between a warm and cold water condition and uh, offshore Svalbard, you see here exactly in the map, this is Prince Carl Forland. And in this map, uh, so the red dots show um, the, uh, the methane seeps that were uh, detected in, uh, during the warm water in August and in yellow uh, during cold condition in May. So what is happening uh, at and below the seafloor? So here, uh, this graph shows the hydrate phase boundary between uh, the methane hydrate, so in solid phase, and uh, the methane gas in the water. So you have the temperature here versus the depth. Um, and here, in particular, this line uh, represents the depth of the seafloor around uh, this transect here <clears throat> that is well studied in, uh, in Svalbard. And um, so in August, uh, where the temperature uh, is high like this, um, um, so it's outside uh, the gas hydrate stability zone. And you can see here that it's, so this is also the bathymetry of, uh, of this transect here. And so we can see that the bottom, um, the limit of the gas hydrate stability zone is down to 410 meter depth. And this represents the methane activity with uh, the bubble showing here. And we also have a strong um, um, biological activity. And in contrast, in, uh, in May, so the water condition uh, is much colder, you can see here in the blue line, and it, uh, it actually crosses uh, the, um, the hydrates uh, boundary. And if I just go back and play it again, you can see that during cold water condition, uh, the gas hydrate uh, stability zone is, um, uh, goes uh, as high as 360 uh, meter depth, and we have a much reduced uh, methane activity and as well as uh, much reduced um, biological um, activity. So um, uh, what we show is that as hydrates um, form rapidly um, and because uh, of low temperature in, uh, in, uh, in winter spring, small hydrate patches consolidate in the uppermost sediment here. And then it's building up a gas hydrate capacitor that then depletes when the hydrate dissociates with, uh, with high temperature. 
and uh, this has um, big this has big consequences in uh, global budgets uh, since most cruises occur in summer because it's much more pleasant and uh, we get much more results actually in uh, in summer and uh, um, the budgets are usually based on uh, on these data. So one of our main technologies in CAGE uh, is the Scalander uh, that can be deployed up to 1500 meter depth. Um, it's troll proof as you see uh, from the shape and then the open panels here allow the free circulation of water. And uh, so we have the possibility for all the instruments listed here uh, measuring different physical and uh, chemical parameters. Um, two of our deployments uh, were offshore Svalbard, uh, like, you say, like you see here on the map. Um, and uh, in particular, we deployed uh, two landers, one here in 90 meter site and another one in 240 um, meter depth. And um, so this uh, figure uh, down shows uh, different time series and uh, you have uh, the methane and the CO2. We have temperature and salinity, uh, pressure and uh, uh, methane solubility as well as oxygen and with magnitude that we calculated from uh, from a model and then the current. So you can see all those different time series and then we can really compare um, uh, what, uh, what can cause uh, the methane release and uh, some sort of the um, interaction between all, um, all parameters. Um, and one of the main conclusion was that the tide actually doesn't affect the methane release because it's it's so shallow there. So this is the 90 meters, and uh, and also it's mainly the wind uh, that is uh, that is controlling the uh, the methane uh, distribution in the water column. So now I wanted to present you um, two uh, new projects that could actually lead to collaboration. Um, this project is called Naremso. And uh, it's meant to establish and expand uh, a national monitoring uh, of the ocean in the Nordic seas. Um, and this project includes glider sections, uh, like you can see here um, in, um, in the map. Um, and we will also update uh, moorings uh, south of Norway and, um, and also um, develop new moorings, uh, such as this one in the Moon Ridge uh, that is uh, on top of. Um, a hydrothermal vent that was previous that was um, recently discovered, and this one uh, south of Svalbard. And we saw this area um, um, from before because, as you can see here, this is the bathymetry of uh, this area, and we call it the pingo uh, because it has this dome shape here. And you see here a straight, a wide line represents the bubbles uh, going up. And it's a 90, it's a 390 meter site. And you can see that bubbles uh, reach uh, really high in the water column. And you can also see here in the video, um, uh, all the bubbling. So it's very, very uh, intense. And so this summer we will deploy um, a uh, um, modified version of the calendar that I just presented, and we will also have a mooring uh, that will have uh, several, uh, several types of, uh, of parameters. And uh, this is also another project that was just funded by NFR. It's called MN7, uh, standing for Environmental Impact of Methane Seepage and Subseabed Characterization at Lover Node 7. And it's what Aston also presented before. Um, so uh, LOVA stands for Lofoten Vesterolen, which is the area here represented uh, on the map. And in particular, this is the Ola Trough, um, where uh, cabled observatories were very recently installed. So we have, because it's cabled, we have data in real time. And in particular, uh, this node seven here is deployed on methane seeps, uh, collecting uh, different physical and chemical parameters. So this project will rely on, uh, on observatory data, as well as research survey, uh, as we will visit the sites every year. So this project starts officially in 21, and uh, uh, we will try um, to uh, answer the following questions. Uh, so what is the influence of oceanic parameters on methane release? What is the fate of methane in the water column? How will the methane release and following CO2 production affect the acidity of ocean, and in particular, uh, all the um, coral reef because it's a very rich uh, area in cold, uh, coral reefs. Um, also, what are the parameters um, constraining the fleet flow and what are the carbon fluxes? And finally, how did the, uh, the seepage evolve in the past? Um, so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Pandict, for um, uh, for the interesting uh, talk. Uh, now, is there is uh, supposed to come a part which is supposed to be the most interesting part of every conference, uh, namely the coffee break. But uh, during the corona times, um, it's not so much fun. Uh, however, I'm sure that we all deserve a little break. Uh, and since we've been a little bit behind the schedule, then I suggest that we still reserve 50 minutes for uh, taking our coffee from wherever we are in the home of offices and gather here at 12.05. So 12.05, we will actually continue with methane.
Welcome back from the coffee break. As I promised, we continue with methane. So it's methane, coffee, methane. Um, yeah, and Martin Lira from Estonian Geological Survey is going to talk again about Svalbard, methane sweeps from Svalbard Fjord sediments. Please, Martin, go on. Thank you very much. Uh, dear audience, dear speakers, I'm very glad that you invited me. It's, very on it's a big honor to be here. And uh, yes, my name is Martin Lira, and I'm coming from Estonian Geological Survey and also from University of Tartu. And today I would like to talk to you a little bit more about methane, but more precisely about methane from fjords, and uh, from the fjords from my special place, Svalbard. Uh, background, uh, as you all already heard several times, the Arctic is warming in a very rapid uh, rate and uh, the clear indication about that is the, the extent of uh, sea ice cover in Arctic Ocean. If you look at the long-term cover, you can see that the, 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 the rapid change in the sea ice cover. And even if we look a little bit uh, shorter time frame, uh, we can see that although there, there are some good days and bad days in, in terms of sea ice cover, the overall trend is very clear and we can say that about uh, the uh, equal size for, uh, for Switzerland, the, the sea ice cover is, is um, decreasing yearly in Arctic Ocean. Of course, the reason for this is quite clear. There is a, a global uh, climate change happening, and this is very pronounced in Arctic region. And uh, one of the things uh, what's driving this is methane, the strong uh, greenhouse gas in, uh, in Arctic region. Uh, Svalbard, the archipelago, in, in just in the mouth of the Arctic Ocean, 
is a very unique place to conduct Arctic research. It's a gateway to Arctic and uh, it's easily accessible and it gives a good opportunity to do research there. Um, today I would like to focus more in uh, Svalbard fjords, mainly the Svalbard main fjord system, the East Fjorden, marked here with this uh, rectangle, and talk a little bit more about that. So, if we look closely at the bathymetry of the East Fjorden system, uh, we can see that it's rather shallow, uh, the, the maximum uh, depth is around 400 meters just, and, but uh, uh, with a close mapping of the seafloor, uh, several uh, seafloor depressions called pockmarks uh, appeared, and there are over uh, thousands uh, of uh, pockmarks in the East Jordan system. The pockmarks are seafloor depressions, they can be elongated or circular, um, they can be quite wide, a couple of hundred meters, and depths up to uh, mm, 10, 20 meters. And uh, it is now um, agreed that these features in a seabed uh, indicate uh, hydrocarbon fluid escape routes. So whenever we can see pockmarks or depressions in a, in a smooth seabed, and, uh, seabed sediments, uh, we can ask a question, is this a hydrocarbon uh, escape route? Uh, this is even a more important question in the shallow depths of uh, fjords, where uh, methane, which is released from sea sediments, uh, to the water column can easily reach also the, the atmosphere and therefore uh, contribute to the global uh, uh, climate change even further. So it's, it's important to study the methane release from sediments. Um, we uh, did a, conducted a research, uh, especially uh, focusing on the pockmarks in the uh, East Fjordan system, uh, sampled the sediments from the pockmarks, and, but, but also from the reference sites uh, outside of pockmarks, and measured the methane concentrations, the free gas concentrations inside the, the sediments. And uh, uh, it was revealed that uh, the methane concentrations in the sediments at the moment in East Jordan are actually quite uh, small and there are no big uh, differences between the reference sites and the pockmarks itself, indicating that uh, although the pockmarks, we have a lot of those pockmarks and some of them are quite big, at the moment the pockmarks are not acting as a fluid escape uh, uh, routes uh, for the hydrocarbon gases. Um, but uh, what about the source of uh, the methane? Where does this methane come from? Uh, Svalbard is in, in a way a very unique place where it's, uh, it's actually an uh, uplifted part of the Barents uh, shelf and uh, as we know there are a lot of gas and oil discoveries in uh, Barents uh, Sea uh, and there are also indications of an uh, active hydrocarbon fluid system in uh, Svalbard region. So it's, uh, it's fair to ask does this methane uh, is it coming from a deep source? Is it a thermogenic methane? Or is it coming from a shallow source? Is it a microbial methane? Because majority of the methanes all around us are mainly uh, microbially mediated. Uh, analyzing methane carbon isotopes together with the uh, uh, ratio between the higher homologous uh, ethane and propane um, we could uh, use the, the conventional cross plot and see that uh, carbon isotope data indicates that uh, this methane is coming from a deep thermogenic source. However, if we consider that the methane was actually very, in very low concentrations, um, this could indicate that um, probably what, is, what has happened in, uh, in fjord sediments, uh, the, the microbes have been uh, consuming the methane preferentially and therefore enriching the, the resi residual gas with ethane and propane and uh, giving us this uh, actually the false thermogenic uh, signal. This is uh, even more um, uh, 
proved by the sulfate profile analysis. The thing is that actually the, the sulfate and methane are tightly coupled, coupled together in the uh, uh, fjord sediments, in uh, seabed sediments, where uh, methane is uh, oxidized uh, very efficiently in the sediments and the <clears throat> microbes are using uh, sulfate as an as a oxygen donor uh, in the sediments. Uh, however, uh, the, the profile of the sulfate um, profile in, in the sediments uh, usually uh, show this concave down uh, profile similar to that we could see in Adventfjorden site. But um, in some cases we can see these small straight linear uh, uh, sulfate profiles and this is um, believed to be uh, due to the uh, larger methane fluxes from a deeper source where uh, more methane is consuming rapidly the sulfate and therefore uh, straightening the sulfate profile in the sediments. So, coupled together the sulfate uh, profiles and also the fact that we have ethane and propane uh, also in uh, fjord sediments, this could indicate that uh, although m methane is microbially uh, oxidized very efficiently in the sediments, some of that is still coming from a deeper source and in uh, bigger fluxes, this could uh, easily end up uh, in uh, uh, water column. However, uh, if some methane will escape the, the uh, anaerobic oxidation in the sediments and will be distributed in a water column, uh, in bigger depths, uh, methane will be oxidized very rapidly and efficiently in the water column. However, uh, considering the shallow depths of the fjords, uh, then uh, the, in a higher fluxes, some of the methane could still reach the atmosphere and uh, contribute to the global warming. So we have to be, even with a small fluxes, we have to be careful because in, a, in a, um, a shallow depths, this could still reach the uh, atmosphere. Uh, also, lastly, I would like to just mention a couple of things about gas hydride. We already had a very good presentation about gas hydride. Uh, there are, this is a big player in, uh, in uh, methane research. Although the, the amount of the methane trapped in a gas hydride, this uh, uh, total amount is varying uh, uh, from time to time, uh, from literature to literature. However, it's still a very big player in, uh, in uh, methane research. And also the Svalbard uh, has uh, suitable temperature and pressure uh, conditions to have gas hydrate systems, uh, especially in uh, onshore where uh, below the permafrost uh, there is uh, very good conditions, but also inside the fjords where in the deeper parts we have suitable conditions for the gas hydrate to uh, to be there. Uh, there is yet to be discovered the gas hydrate in uh, fjord sediments, however, uh, we should consider uh, this, uh, uh, this aspect that the, that the dissociation of a gas hydrate from the fjord sediments uh, could uh, lead up even bigger methane fluxes in, a, in a shallow fjords. So, um, mm, just to conclude, thank you very much for uh, listening to me. That was a very short overview of, my, of the research in uh, methane in uh, Svalbard fjords. I would like to thank all of my collaborators, my family, of course, and my, my supervisors, and uh, Professor Rico Normans from University of Svalbard. Thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you very much, Martin. Yes, questions, questions, questions. If you have questions, please uh, post them to the forum or send in uh, the end of the session. We have a small discussion 
And uh, if you have any comments, questions, suggestions, opinions, then you can already think of preparing them. But I would now uh, like to introduce the next speaker, Ayman Wenzel. It's a very, really interesting talk about um, Siberian in the ingenious hunters. So please, Aymar, that's your turn. Um, um, yes, I'm Aymar Wenzel. I'm from the University of Tartu. And I'm an anthropologist, and um, my talk uh, yeah, has a title, Siberian Indigenous People, The Last Hunters of the Arctic. Um, years ago, I used to be a great fan of um, uh, uh, documentary series um, by the Na National Geographic. And um, the series was Yukon Men. One of my colleagues, former colleagues, worked in, in Alaska and, uh, and the series was about trappers in, um, on Alaska. Um, and we uh, talked about it um, and she said that actually this series is fake. So basically these trappers are no professional trappers. They don't earn their living um, uh, with hunting and trapping. And then years after that, um, I talked to my colleagues uh, in Canada, and they also confirmed that actually in Canada, their indigenous people are not living of hunting. I've done field work in Siberia um, uh, for many decades already, and um, Siberia seems to be, or Russian Arctic seems to be the place where we still do have professional hunters and trappers and probably the only region in the Arctic where you have still people who live off it. So uh, this is their one of their very important in income, sometimes the main income. And this is uh, Russian Russia as such. Um, Arctic is the northern part, as you know, and uh, this uh, red square is where I've done my field work, but I'm gonna sh show you or present two case studies uh, from that region um, and from another one, so I go back. Another one is somewhere here. And I start with uh, a small place called Saidu, uh, which is um, small hunters um, settlement located in what's called uh, forest tundra. And basically this is a huge swamp with a little bit forest on it. And this is the village. So there are a few moments that when we talk about indigenous people in the Arctic, uh, we people don't uh, assume people are usually living in the villages and they're not living somewhere in the, uh, in, in the forest or in the tundra, but they also do hunting. So hunting is done outside of the village. People have their hunting lodges there. Uh, and also what is very little known is that hunting is just one part of local economy. For instance, Saidu is very famous for its uh, gla uh, glass houses, gardening, yeah. but also hunting is combined with breeding. And of course, uh, when we talk about indigenous people uh, in context of Arctic, uh, then people very much stress about the culture and religion. And I'm going to say a few words about it, why it's a little bit misplaced. But yes, hunting is related to a lot of um, um, religious um, rituals. Like on the left, you see uh, sacrifice to local uh, spirits and then holy graves on the right, uh, right side. And then I uh, jump over those of you who don't know um, Cyrillic, so to the village which is called Popigai. Popigai is a very small village somewhere in the northern, northern tundra, uh, close to the Daimur Peninsula. And this is so insignificant uh, village that it's not even, even on the map. And um, when the first village, uh, Saidu, was inhabited by northern Saha or Yakut people, this is inhabited by Tolgan people. So the language is the same, basically. And there is a huge discussion whether Tolgan language is a dialect or of Saha language or their own language. But then again, so this is a village uh, in the middle of nowhere. 
a small village inhabited by something like 300 people. Saidu was inhabited by 600 people, and this is very typical hunter's village in northern regions of um, uh, Russian, uh, of the Russian Arctic. And uh, to reach this village, you have to, basically the only way is by the snowmobile. Uh, that mean, and in the summer by boat, um, it's uh, 400 kilometers away from the nearest bigger village, but to reach this 400 or to cover the 400 kilometers takes usually uh, one day or even more. So basically, progressing on snowmobiles in the tundra is a pretty slow process. And uh, uh, here again, so what people do, um, they combine hunting with fishing. So uh, they hunt wild reindeer, they fish, and they also have some domestic reindeer. And um, why I think hunting is very important. So hunting is not only a cultural issue. Uh, professional hunting in Russia is very important for people for remote settlements. So, uh, for many families, this is the main income. Uh, so basically what they do, they um, take on credit uh, supplies um, at the beginning of the hunting season. And then um, they pay it back by, by meat and furs. Uh, what most people don't know uh, or uh, is that hunting is foremost a legal matter in the sense that hunting is regulated by the laws. Uh, at that, say, that says that hunting is important also for the state itself. So there are hunting quotas, hunting laws, uh, hunting licenses, um, all the thing around it. And uh, hunting is, when you go to the Russian Arctic, hunting is also very important source of meat and furs for the local population. So all the meat um, hunted goes to the market. So hunting is part of the market economy and um, meat uh, of wild reindeer is part of uh, local diet uh, for most people of the region. And um, furs are usually used to make um, winter clothing, uh, especially boots. And you really cannot take it away of local, let's say, life uh, when the meat is gone and all the furs are gone. So I really don't see how you can replace it. You can do it and people do it because there are modern polar clothing um, um, becoming more and more fashionable, but they are very expensive. And um, foremost, so why is hunting important um, for Mm, the, uh, for Russia as a state. And I would say the hunting for hunters, uh, it's um, related to the politics. I don't know whether you know, but in Russia, approximately 10 years or even more, there is a talk about the um, coming uh, World War, Third World War in the Arctic. Um, so there is a huge narrative that when the war starts, it's going to be in the Arctic. And since Russia has very huge Arctic territories, uh, a lot of these ideologists, they assume that this war is going to start in Russia about Russian Arctic. And therefore, um, keeping the population in the Arctic is a political issue. Um, there has been talks in Russia about depopulating the Arctic because it's very expensive to keep people there. Uh, but um, from political uh, issues or because of politics, uh, these settlements and these people are still kept there. Uh, I mean, here they are also partially subsidized by the state. Um, and um, uh, so this is kind of marker of the economy and therefore hunting itself uh, is also kept there as a profession part of economy because you cannot keep people there so russia as a state is not capable uh, subsidizing all the indigenous people in the arctic as does the united states or canada uh, they have to earn their living somehow and uh, therefore, I would say um, a part of this old culture uh, or cultural issues, uh, 
uh, which are related with the indigenous people, we also should uh, consider that uh, a part of the northern sea route and um, militarization of the Arctic, uh, also indigenous people has for the Russian Federation very important um, political meaning. So I would say indigenous people in the Arctic, in the Russian Arctic, they are there and they are there to stay. And um, there are also very many aspects um, of their stay a part of these cultural and linguistic issues. And um, these issues are economic, political, but also legal. And here I say thank you. Uh, I'm ready for comments and questions later. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heimer. Interesting things that you do and in completely other part of the Arctic as uh, the rest of us. So uh, re very refreshing to hear about that. Um, the next speaker will be, will be Margaret Sata Smetschek from uh, Tromsø. And um, uh, the presentation will be about the evolution and effectiveness of the Arctic Councils lessons for Arctic governance and beyond. So please, Malgor Zata, are you online? Yes. Yes, can you hear me well? Is it yes, right? we hear you well. Go on. Great. Um, thank you very much. Most of all, thank you to the organizers for invitation to this excellent symposium. It is really my great pleasure to, um, to take part in this today, partly because um, well, as we've heard from, from the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Estonia, the start, well, it is not only um, it is not only the 100th anniversary um, of relationship between Estonia and Norway, um, but it is also this year, it is 25th anniversary of the Arctic Council. So um, the body that was mentioned that Estonia is applying to be, to be observer. So it is um, really my pleasure to have this talk here. Um, because my focus on the Arctic Council, my background is in political scientists, um, and I have studied the, the Arctic Council um, for several reasons. And one of them um, is basically that, as so many speakers here uh, are studying physical changes in the Arctic, for me, the Arctic Council represents a fascinating case of original institutions at the forefront of global climate change. So of course, as the whole world is, is changing, there is also a question how we are adjusting, how our governance mechanisms are evolving to respond to those challenges. And the Arctic Council in this case is an extremely interesting example because it has started from very unauspicious beginnings 25 years ago to become truly a primary intergovernmental forum for cooperation on issues of environmental protection and sustainable development in the Arctic. So in my research, I have been first interested um, in evolution of the Arctic Council, which has a set of features that actually make it quite unique in the international landscape, and most of all, how we can think more systematically about the Council's performance and effectiveness. And here um, we can see the first page of the declaration that established the Arctic Council in 1996. And this is actually one of the, um, of course, most defining features of, of the Arctic Council, namely that um, AC is not based um, on a treaty, but a non but on a non-legally binding instrument, the declaration itself. And it is um, partly thanks to, or most of all, thanks to this arrangement, the fact that the council is not bound by the um, Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties that has allowed it to establish, to evolve um, a largely unique form of involvement of organizations of Arctic Arctic indigenous peoples as permanent participants who have um, who need to be consulted on all matters discussed in the Arctic Council, who sit with the Arctic ministers um, at the table at the ministerial meetings, and which really, if we compare it across across the world, makes it um, largely unprecedented form of very high position given to native peoples. As as of course um, it was it was mentioned. 
Um, already concerning observers, uh, the Arctic Council is also open to non-Arctic states and organizations to, to apply for observer status with the Council. Um, but another thing less about the structure, but more about focus of the Arctic Council has been very strong knowledge generation and science policy component, which has everything to do with the start of the Arctic Council in beginnings of 1990s, where um, basically the Council was based on science science activities of the working groups. Um, and it was a process that was very much bottom up driven by experts contributing through uh, working groups of the Arctic Council. So this is, um, those are a um, few things regarding the Arctic Council. And of course, what, what has been interesting for, for me in, the, in this case has been also the arc that over 25 years, how the council has moved from peripheries of global international affairs to pretty much their center. And this, this entire process started around 2005, 2000, Seven. So the first decade of the Arctic Council was pretty much dominated by scientific activities with very low interest of, of the outside world in, in the work of the Arctic Council. However, the, one of the most seminal works of the Council, Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, that was published 2004 and 2005, and was followed by the series of events in 2007, it all resulted in a rapidly growing interest in the Arctic and in the Arctic Council itself. So those events from 2007, 2008, um, some of um, persons in this group might be very well familiar with them. They included not only IPCC report from, from 2007 about the, about the scale of, of Arctic change, but also planting of Russian flag um, on the North Pole, on the seabed of, of the North Pole, um, as well as um, famous 2000, 2008 studies from the um, US Geological Survey concerning estimates about oil and gas reserves in, in the North. So as said, that um, all this led to a um, huge surge of interest in, in the Arctic Council, including um, significantly higher number of applications for, for the status of observers. So the, so the Council took a series of measures on its part to try to adopt to, to, this new, to this new reality. What is interesting that all those changes, they have taken place without any major change in the rules of procedures, as they were all possible within the within the original setup of the council. So among others, um, the AEC went on Arctic states, went on to um, define uh, more specific criteria for, for new observers. They admitted um, new observers, so, um, quite, quite a few new observers since um, 2013. Today, before the ministerial meeting in May, we have um, 38 observers plus the EU that is a that works as a de facto observer to, to the council. Um, importantly, the council opened the permanent secretariat located here in Tromsø in 2014. Um, among others, um, it also facilitated creation of bodies such as Arctic Economic Council, um, but also Arctic Coast Guard Forum, Arctic Offshore Regula and Arctic Offshore Regulators Forums to try to create bodies able to um, have a dialogue and foster cooperation on issues that are of steadily growing importance in the regions. But there were also other, other changes um, that have been particularly interested for me in my research, and those included, among others, um, incorporation or establishment of task forces in, in the Arctic Council, and um, especially uh, legally binding agreements, which actually um, came as a product of the work of these task forces. So those legally binding agreements that generated huge interest um, in the Arctic Council, um, so to say, policy making ability, um, they concert search and rescue in, in the Arctic um, measures against oil pollution, but also how to enhance scientific cooperation in, in the region. It is important to underline here that 
those legally binding agreements, they are not agreements of the Arctic Council per se. Arctic Council um, purely served as a forum, as a platform for their negotiations, and all those agreements were signed among eight Arctic states at the ministerial meetings. What has been also interesting is concerns ministerial meetings themselves. So as the Arctic issues have been going steadily up on agendas, on political agendas of all Arctic countries and beyond them, we have also seen um, how the, the character of meetings have, um, have changed. So in the past, for instance, one of the standard elements was that working groups, scientific power horses of the Arctic Council, were having their presentations to the ministers. Today, there is no place for, for this. And here you can see a picture of the ministerial meeting two, two years ago in, in Ravanimi. That's the picture I, um, I took from, from the back of the room attending this meeting as observer with International Arctic Science Committee. Um, of course, that was, that was actually the second meeting that in the history of the council was attended by all eight um, ministers of foreign affairs um, from, from Arctic from Arctic countries, which of course says something about the huge um, evolution that, that the council took over, over the last 20 years. And of course here, I'm not referring to the fact of position of United States regarding climate change at, at that meeting. But anyways, um, the meeting was covered by New, by New York Times and many other major global outlets, which also say something about where Arctic issues stand today. So moving to a second part, the question was, um, the question that I've been interested in is how effective has the Arctic Council been? And I find this question particularly important because we've seen the study flow of proposals of how to enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of the Arctic Council and how to think about it, especially as the Council issued those or help, helped to negotiate those legally binding agreements. However, the major contributions that we have seen from, from the Arctic Council to Arctic governance, um, they have actually very little to do uh, with regulation per se, even though Council has played a very important supporting work in, in relevant regulations. So what we know is that the Arctic Council over the last 25 years, what it has done best is that it identified, it helped to identify emerging issues and then um, helped to frame, frame them for considerations in policy discussions. And of course, today, Arctic climate change is something so obvious to us, but we can, uh, but we can see a constant flow of new issues asking for, for our attention. And of course, just to name a few, it would be marine litter, wildfires, of even, or even the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in the region. This work, this knowledge generated in the Arctic Council, it informed in turn and occasionally, only occasionally, influenced international processes, some of them of huge significance to, to the Arctic. And here, of course, so, um, some of the most important work concern um, support to negotiations of Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, but also Minamata Convention on Mercury, um, PAIM, uh, one of the working groups of the Arctic Council, has um, provided very important boost to negotiations of polar code and in international maritime organizations, CAF, um, biodiversity working groups, um, works and collaborates closely with Convention on Biological Diversity. And of course, um, research related to climate change um, has is a constant input to processes in IPCC. So this is pretty much where we have seen that Arctic Council has been doing its best. Um, but I guess one of the one of the questions is, of course, well, how we have done in the past. It's also how we can uh, what we should consider moving forward. And I think um, here are just a few observations. Um, and this is second to, to last slide, is that as we are moving um, as we are moving forward in a world that is uh, more and more changed by climate change, um, there, is, there is a constant need or ever pressing need for thinking of governance arrangements that, you, that would be suitable to operate under conditions of change. And we have seen today so many presentations around that, including, for instance, um, the one about 
changes in fish, fish stocks. Um, so we have to be accounting for conditions of change, but also interconnectivity. And here is one point that um, might be well familiar to, to many persons looking at Arctic governance is that um, the Arctic is, um, and I will move here. In the Arctic, we have something um, that we could call Arctic mosaic. So here you can see Arctic Council at the, the very core, but what you, but you, the logos that you see around uh, represent plethora of international science um, and the regulatory bodies, all of relevance to the Arctic. So of course, UNFCCC, previously mentioned conventions, and also many other bodies that are providing scientific input and knowledge to Arctic processes. So, um, um, it is really important in this respect, and, I, and I'm saying this from, from the observations of, so to say, many practices that oftentimes our thinking goes toward, um, goes toward regulation and viewing legally binding arrangements as the ones that might be uh, most effective to face challenges that we have. However, we need to account that um, as as we are moving, as we are moving forward, um, most critical problems in the world today are highly complex and interconnected. And oftentimes, the um, source of the problem lies not exactly where results of the problem are mo mo most felt. Pollution and climate change are, of course, the best example. But so it also shows us how regulatory mechanisms that by definition apply only to the parties that actually sign up to them might be not the most effective ways of, of moving forward. Um, and I think in this case, the, the Arctic, well, as often we are saying that, well, climate change in the, in the Arctic has such important implications for the rest of the world. I think that when it comes to governance in the Arctic, um, we might actually draw very important lessons for also for the rest of the world. However, at the same time, it seems that we are at the at some sort of juncture. So as um, as political cloud or um, so to say, as high level interest grows in in Arctic matters, um, there is a question if we can if we dare to think creatively about ways to address challenges ahead. Had. And I think with the Arctic Council, we have an excellent, excellent instrument at hand, which is um, innately flexible, which I would say is a huge advantage in the, in the current context, because not only the Council has proven that it's relatively easy to adjust, but um, even more importantly, it, it allows for much enhanced participation on non-state actors. So there is this question of how we are going to to move forward and how perhaps we could grasp the, um, the greatest benefits of the Arctic Council that could really serve as a platform to, to bring all relevant partners together. So with this, thank you very much. Thank you, Malkar Sata. That was now a very useful, useful overview for um, about the Arctic Council and also how the research and science uh, fits into that picture because we researchers often don't have the understanding of the really big schemes of where we fit in. Thank you. So uh, let's move forward with the next presenter who is Erko Jakobson from Data Observatory and he's talking about expeditions to Arctic. Hello. Hello. Okay. My name is Erko Jakobson. 
my presentation is about uh, expeditions to Arctic. And uh, so I can't see my slides. <laughs> I have a problem with my screen. I can't. I can't see my slides. Okay, but you can see my slides. My I. Okay. Uh, uh, so I've been in Arctic uh, four times with the Arctic uh, research. First two times. Uh, so the first two times were to the Vessel uh, Tara, number one, you can see there is uh, uh, number one, you can see there is uh, uh, where the drift started at the ice edge in September 2006. And uh, in spring 2007, it has drifted to almost to North Pole. Uh, then, uh, and uh, we did uh, a lot of uh, atmospheric measurements there. Then in 2009, we did uh, measurements in New Orleans, in uh, Spitsbergen, and 2014 in Hornsund. And uh, when we went in 2006, autumn, then there was uh, the ice flow that was three meter thick. So it was, so the, this tree was only two meter. But uh, nowadays uh, there is not so, so good ice anymore in the Arctic. And uh, there are pictures of uh, ice uh, situation. Uh, this uh, pink line is Tara drift. So we started in 2006 in September. When 2007 was open water already. And uh, you can see comparison the black line of uh, from drift it was much longer. It was a century ago, there was even more ice. And uh, this right side picture, you can see ice situation last September. And you can see that uh, uh, east north uh, passage is totally ice free. And it will be I'm afraid that it can be our future normal. And uh, one more wish about uh, ice is that the previous speaker spoke about uh, ice minimums and uh, degrees in ice. But one thing also is that if we look, for example, ice extent 6 million, then you can see that uh, the time period when there is uh, such low ice extent, the time period is much, much longer. And uh, that's why the, the period when the Arctic gets uh, absorbs more the sun energy is longer 
and so the energy is much higher and that also increases the warming. About our measurements, this is our the most important uh, instrument, the the line balloon that we had. Uh, we made uh, very good uh, high resolution atmospheric profiles of temperature, humidity, and wind. And we did also radiation measurements there. And also you can see a small radiation must, okay, not small, 10 meter. And there is our balloon. And uh, there is uh, Tima Palo with the Estonia flags, flag next to Norwegian flag, who uh, stayed there whole summer and made a lot of uh, very good uh, measurements. And about the results, the biggest result was that the, the climate model, the atmospheric models and the analysis were even worse than we hoped. Or because uh, you can see the black line, there is, there is only temperature, other parameters were also not very good. The black line is average of measure profiles and the other lines are atmosphere models and the analysis. And you can see that the differences are really big, especially Japanese uh, analysis model. And uh, even the best was ERA interim at that time and still lower, lower 200 meters, uh, the result uh, were, there was really big uh, bias. And uh, for single measurements, you can see that uh, biases can exceed uh, 10 degrees. That is really not good. So it's very good proof that uh, we need more in situ measurements because uh, these models they take satellite data into account but it's not good enough because you need to adjust your satellite data also with uh, in situ measurements and if there is no good in situ measurements then your results are, can be quite bad. And uh, from 2014, we started uh, analyzing how this uh, Arctic uh, climate change uh, can affect the Baltic Sea region, because the regions are actually quite close. And uh, there should be connection. And uh, at first we analyzed the reanalysis models from 2019, I started with uh, climate models and samples. From this model is uh, I used uh, NCAR uh, CESM lens database. It's the control database is from 400 to 2100, and it is uh, a fixed uh, atmosphere forcing from the period uh, before industrial time, so 1815, 1850. And if you look at uh, control time and uh, compare the black, black boxes, we call it the uh, Baltic Sea region, we take its average and we co compare it with the uh, Arctic, and there is uh, Arctic ice, and then uh, in the Botnia and uh, Siberia ice, and the connection is uh, very normal that uh, when there is uh, uh, lower temperatures, then there is more ice, so correlation is negative. 
but in Central Arctic, <coughs> the connection is vice versa. So if in the Central Arctic, there is less less ice, uh, then we have lower temperatures. But uh, it was it was control. But if we look uh, ensemble data with uh, measured uh, external forcing are from uh, from this sensory from uh, RTP 8.5 projections then we can see that uh, these regions when that are that have uh, quite high correlation with our region the regions are changing so end of century the Ar central arctic there is uh, no such uh, connection anymore but it is uh, it has moved and the connection is the correlation in the central part the, the, in the contour run it is uh, quite high from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 for other peric measurements it's the correlation is uh, quite high and uh, i will show some uh, <coughs> extremal things about estonia so uh, at first, you can see extreme, extremal uh, changes, uh, changes in ex extremes. And uh, if we look uh, extremal temperatures, negative temperatures, so for example, number of days uh, with, with daily average temperature below minus 20, then um, when last century, it was averagely about five days, and then at the end of century, it can happen, but uh, mostly, most most years you can't see in Estonia daily average temperature minus twenty. And uh, if you look uh, positive, so high uh, temperatures, then also measurements. Uh, have shown that we we have had several times temperature daily average temperatures above twenty six degrees Celsius, but definitely not every year. Then this model predicts that at the end of uh, our century, Estonia we will get the really high number of uh, very hot, very hot days. So, about one month per year with uh, such extreme temperatures, it's, it will be normal. Of course, let's hope that uh, we can, that this uh, RGP 8.5, we can change something that uh, the situation will not be so bad. Uh, but the reality is it can turn this way. And finally, we are seeking collaboration. And uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's time to introduce the next speaker, Kerim Nisaatsioglu. I'm afraid this is the only name I can pronounce uh, correctly. So please, Kerim, forgive me if, uh, if this is not right. Uh, from the University of Peregrine anyway, and from Norway. Um, ice ocean interactions and stability of the Greenland I sheet. Very interesting presentation, so please, Karim, go on. Thank you. Um, so my name is Karim Hessens Nisanjolo, not the easiest name. Uh, I'm a professor of climate dynamics at the University of Bergen and the Beckman Center, where I lead the polar research group. Um, and I'm going to talk about ice ocean interactions a bit about uh, a lot has been said about sea ice. So I'll focus a little bit more on the green ice sheet. Uh, this is contributions from many, but in particular PhDs, Anais and the postdoc Marie, Marie Jensen and Shooting Yang from the Danish Meteorological uh, Institute, uh, uh, plus many more. 
Uh, you've already been introduced to the Bjerknes Center by Esten Jansson. We're about 250 scientists, uh, 40 nations. Uh, it's a very vibrant interdisciplinary research environment and I very much welcome you all to come to Bergen and to visit us. We're about 60 polar um, in the polar research team, which I uh, run. And uh, we also have four other, or we total of four research groups, global, polar, carbon and hazards. But I would say that a lot of uh, what we do in Bergen is polar climate science. A lot of our focus in terms of key scientific questions is regarding Arctic Atlantic climate uh, and variability, both in the past, present, and in the future. So I'm going to talk about the Arctic and how it relates to the changes that we see relates to the Greenland ice sheet. This shows a simulation on your right, which is the Greenland ice sheet uh, coupled simulation with the global climate model, including sea ice and everything, where actually the Greenland ice sheet is dynamically responding. Uh, this is the easier Earth model. It's one of the very few that actually has uh, this capability of running coupled long simulations. This is many, many hundred years into the future. What I want to point out in the main figure here is the sea ice, and this is the sea ice changes in the summer, and you can see that sea ice is practically gone by 2050. This is the business as usual. And as Mario showed, we are pretty close to that, even though that's the extreme scenario that we don't expect will be reality. But for sea ice, it seems to be very close reality. Winter sea ice will disappear in closer to, to 2130, uh, and you'll have an ice-free ocean winter and summer in this scenario. Um, so this is what it looks like. Summer from 2040, 50, that's uh, what you will have most likely, very little summer sea ice, but you will still have a uh, significant area of winter sea ice. Although the sea ice will be very thin, your area of sea ice will be uh, significant. So there's a big seasonality in the sea ice. So what is the impact of these changes in the Arctic. So temperature is rising, sea ice is decreasing. What is the impact of Greenland? Uh, the ocean is warming, which is also really important. I won't have much time to talk about that, but it's a big part of what we're doing here. Is not only to look at the, for example, here, the mass balance changes. This is from the GRACE and uh, NASA uh, compilation until 2020, just released recently, the update with the new GRACE satellite data. So this is uh, showing that the green ice sheet is melting now up to 2000 meters at altitude. Um, this is uh, unprecedented in the at least instrumental records. You might find one or two years in 1800s when you had melt up to the summit of the Greenland, but this is something that's very recent and it's accelerating. You have more melt and runoff and contribution there to sea level from Greenland. Um, so when you look at Greenland, it looked like a wise beautiful ice cap. And of course it is, but in reality, it's a very dynamic system. So in addition to the surface melting that you see on Greenland, you also have a lot of uh, flow. You have very strong flow. It's a very dynamic system. And so these blue areas, purple areas are ice streams. And those are flowing um, systems of flowing ice, rivers of ice, which uh, transport a lot of ice out to the coast of Greenland. And this one system in the Northeast contributes, this is the Northeast Greenland ice stream contributes about 15% of the mass loss from Greenland. So it's a dynamic system. Uh, and what we're doing now, and I wanna talk a little bit about and introduce you is a, is a new ice core into the system because we found several years ago uh, with the PhD in the Bergen actually that this northeastern part of the green ice sheet is most vulnerable. If you look at back in time, it's the area which was the ice sheet retreated the most uh, in the past, in the last interglacial 120,000 years ago. And we expect it will also respond quite uh, uh, significantly into climate change in the future. So that's why we're going there because it's flowing fast. We don't want to understand that. We also want to understand what's the vulnerability, how much sea level contribution can we get from this area? How important is the ocean temperature along the coast in destabilizing these small ice shelves? Are they not small, but significant? And how that imp impacts the upstream flow of the ice uh, stream in this case. So an ice stream looks like this. It's like a highway of ice. It's, a, as I said, a very dynamic system flowing and producing uh, icebergs. So when you come out to the coast, this is just showing Jakobshavn, very famous glacier on the west coast of Greenland. I've been working here several years with colleagues and PhDs. I won't talk about that either, but this system is very interesting. It, pr it produces also large amounts of ice. And you'll see here just in a video from Jason Almondson, colleague, colleague from uh, US, that these large icebergs, they break off uh, continuously. And this is about a kilometer of ice uh, now flowing into the fjord and melting and contributing to sea level. It's a natural thing. It has always occurred. The question is now that it's accelerating, will it continue accelerating and how much will it potentially contribute to sea level? And how important is the ocean temperature? How important is the atmospheric temperature? And changes in sea ice is part of that in the Arctic. 
Right, so um, our project, uh, which is where I'm a PI from Norway, um, we have a lot of colleagues from around the world, including uh, European, uh, Asian, and American. It's led by the Danish uh, University, the Copenhagen University, the Nisbo Institute, uh, who we work with for many years now. And this is the uh, close to what Rein uh, talked about earlier. Uh, there's a long history of ice scoring on Greenland, starting Billy Donskord and Chester Langway in the 60s in, in, uh, in uh, Camp Century. This is a modern, uh, I would say, uh, field site. Um, I've been there now uh, every summer except the last because of uh, COVID. And we're extracting a, a deep ice core to the bottom to understand better the process of the bottom ice sheet. As was shown by a previous speaker here, there is melt water on the surface that gets into the bottom of the ice sheet through moulins along the coast and that lubricates the bottom. So there's fluids, there's uh, heat, actually this site, geothermal heat even, uh, maybe even hydrothermal, and it produces pretty fast or very fast flow. At this site, the ice moves at about 60 meters per year. If you get to the coast, it's kilometers per year. This is what it looks like inside and our camp, the script. Uh, um, we're continuously producing ice cores and, and using a lot of time in on-site actually uh, analyzing uh, online doing isotopes, doing uh, chemical um, measurements and, and the structure of the ice crystals because it's a fast flowing system. It's very different from any, anywhere else that we've been drilling ice cores in the past. Uh, this is just me shaving, make, get, getting this ice core ready uh, for analysis. All right, we don't have time to go into the details. I'm just giving you an overview. This is to show you that this is um, what one of the, one of the many things that we're doing on Greenland is trying to understand this very fast flowing dynamical um, area of Greenland, the northeastern Greenland ice stream. Uh, it turns out, and these are just different re, re, um, or, uh, not reconstructions, but uh, models for the geothermal heat underneath the ice stream. You can see there's the most extreme one has a hot spot uh, just right under the uh, start of this ice stream is part of the reason why it's flowing so fast. The question is, uh, uh, why, once you trigger it, will it continue and you change, for example, the conditions at the surface uh, and at the front of this ice, will it accelerate? Uh, so this is a big research effort going into this and we use these highly sophisticated ice flow models, in this case ISSM from JPL. In addition to this ongoing project on Greenland and, and the, what Marius and others talked about in terms of our Arctic research at the Data Center, um, we, we're also involved in the Beyond Epica, oldest ice core drilling project, which was also mentioned here. Uh, so we have, in addition to the scientists involved from Bergen, we also have two PhDs now as part of a consortium in the EU project working on the deep ice core and, and the big questions that lie behind it basically going beyond 1 million years into the past and looking at the relationships between climate, temperature, and, and the greenhouse gases. Uh, in addition to this, we had an effort, and we tried twice, and we won't give up. We'll try again to uh, drill an ice core on Svalbard and to redo some of the great work that was pioneered by, by our predecessors and, uh, and was also presented a little bit here. This is collaboration with the Polar Institute. We still haven't got it funded, and the University of Copenhagen and uh, the University of Ven Venice um, so this is an, uh, uh, an effort to get an ice core from Svalbard to look at the variability in temperature and sea ice. As we know, as what Aston showed, this is a very vulnerable region. This is where the temperatures are increasing the fastest. And this is also where sea ice impacts um, very visibly the climate, in particular on Svalbard. Uh, in addition <clears throat> to that, we're working further on the Northeast Green Ice Stream, trying to understand how it's responding to change in the ocean. And not the least, uh, we are educating new generation of climate scientists. So every year we take our students out into the field. We have an international group of PhDs that meet every year for two weeks and do great science together and develop new ideas and, and train to become a new type of interdisciplinary polar climate scientist. Okay, and with that, I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karim. Thank you so much, Karim. It was an interesting talk. Um, makes me feel you uh, want to know more about it, but thank you very much for being in time because those online conferences are very hard to run for a chairwoman, trust me. <laughs> uh, anyway, we now move from core drilling to algae plumes and continue with Hanna Kauko. She's talking um, about drivers of algae plumes in the Polar Sea, and she's from Norwegian Polar Institute. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, let's see. Okay, 
Yes, so time is tight. I'll just go straight in. I'll just point out that I, of course, present work from, from many, many people and many organizations, but um, I'm a postdoc at the Norwegian Paul Institute in Tromsø. And I'll talk about algae, like the, like the title said, and um, I've understood we have, or we've seen also, we have quite diverse backgrounds, so I take some introduction first. Um, so algae are like plants in the aquatic environments in the sense that they provide the food, for example, via photosynthesis, and of course some of these are also ancestors of the land plants. And then I talk about phytoplankton and algae, and these are microscopic single-celled organisms in the water column and in sea ice, and you see some of them in the background. And um, why, why we care, like I said, uh, marine food webs rely on algae, they make the food. Um, except in some peculiar deep sea ecosystems. And um, of course, uh, the photosynthesis uses uh, carbon dioxide. So they are also players in the carbon cycle. They're tiny, but they're very many. So they're also important. So studying them uh, gives us a better understanding of the ecosystem, but uh, also has relevance, for example, for spatial planning of ecosystem management, like my current project. And uh, then I talk about algal blooms, and that is a time, uh, especially here in the higher latitudes, where we get a relatively rapid increase in algal biomass um, when the conditions are right. And then the ones living in Norway probably or might be familiar with the spring bloom happening around this time around along the coast, and, and the ones in at the Baltic Sea probably know the cyanobacteria blooms in the summer. Those are maybe not so nice for us, but in general, these are spring blooms, for example, are very important for the ecosystem because a large part of the yearly primary production happens then. And to, do, to be able to grow and, and form these blooms, the algae needs sunlight and nutrients, um, exactly like your, your, like your plants in the office or at home. And, and these are the environmental drivers, the main drivers of growth. There's, of course, also the mortality environment. They are eaten and grazed, but I'll, I'll concentrate on the growth and more um, exactly on the sunlight. So we've heard the whole morning how much the Arctic is changing, especially ice cape, and that um, for these creatures leads to a large extent uh, to changes in the light climate. So when we have less ice uh, or shorter period, there might be more light in the water column, for example. So then we we have these questions, how did algae then respond and react to the increased light availability? Is the growth or community composition affected? And can it also be too much? Because the traditional environment under the thick ice is very, very dark. So can they protect themselves? So I'll, I'll show some uh, results of, um, of this uh, project, the NIS 2015, where we had a half a year long drift expedition in the back ice north of Svalbard, you see the map on the right where this research vessel Lance was uh, frozen into the ice and drifting with, uh, with four different ice falls for half a year. And a very broad project from atmosphere to the deep ocean. I'll of course talk about the ecosystem part. Um, another picture from the expedition, you see the, so from top area photo, you see the um, vessel. And then two types of ice. So here the gray part on the right side is, um, it was open water and then it froze again. So it's thin young ice. Um, we see them from the difference of the color that this was thin ice, there's little snow. There's actually more light going through to the water column than on the left where we have this thicker ice with a lot of snow, half a meter of snow. So hardly anything goes through there. Five to 40% of the sunlight goes through this part on the right. So that's obviously a different type of um, environment for the algae to be in. So some of them live in the, inside the sea ice, like I mentioned. And we've, uh, for example, look at their uh, sunscreens, so their uh, sunglasses or their photo protection. Um, so here the two graphs are, um, are a time series of concentrations of these pigments. So that's the May month on the x-axis, and you'd have to care so much about what type of pigments, but these are two types of pigments and they have relationship to the chlorophyll A, the main photosynthetic pigment. And also the colors we can now skip. So, but simply said, there is um, more later in the spring and then earlier in spring, and especially on the right side, the MAAs, the UV protecting pigments, we have some very high ratios there uh, that are highest among the measured in the Arctic. So, 
this tells us um, it was an um, uh, environment where high protection port was needed to some extent, maybe a stressful environment. But they had to, the algae had to invest in this port for the protection. But on the other hand, we see that they were also able to, to uh, synthesize and make this protection on the course of, of the time and, and when acclimated to this environment. And another um, um, point that points to that they were coping well in this environment is that we, in this new ice that was developing on, on spot when we were um, studying it, we got the species succession towards a very typical CS community that we also find below the or inside the thick ice with the dark environment. So we, this is again also the time on the x-axis is uh, schematics, but we have here the Four weeks of time. We start with maybe a bit different or, or a various community, but at the end on the right we get these longish cells, so it's Navicula and Nichia species, the, the most typical ones, and that are the same that we found also in the old eyes nearby. So despite of this highlight environment, we get a very a penate diatom dominance. Diatom is the main type of ice algae. Uh, and a typical community. And then more so, it seems like the old ice around functioned as a seed repository for this new ice that was forming there in spring. Um, because the bottom, sea bottom is far away and the water column have different communities. So this then of course leads us to think what happens when we are losing the older uh, ice. So in the Arctic, it's not only less ice, but it's only also younger and, and multi all the air ice is disappearing. So we'll, for example, change community composition. We also had an algal bloom in the water column below the ice, a different type, these round colonies with round cells. Um, you see also on the left side, the clear blue waters before the bloom and then green waters. Like I said, below this typical ice type is very dark, but actually to make long story short, it was these leads, so similar to the gray area in the earlier picture, some with thin ice, some open, these cracks and leads in the ice that provided then enough light under the ice for a bloom to develop there as well. And this is a topic that has received a lot of attention in last years, that we actually have more production under the ice that we previously thought that is not as dark as we thought. And then one could ask if this is also increasing with the changes in the ice cave. Uh, time is a bit tight, so I won't go into Southern Ocean project, but this is what I'm currently working on. Um, and based on the cruise data from 2019, but also satellite data, I've also here been looking at the phytoplankton blooms and when do they happen and how that relates, for example, to the sea ice cover period and, and the light limitation from that. So uh, I just skip this and then um, summarize quickly. We had an uh, ice island community success into very typical community, which was not controlled by the light environment. There was high investment in protection, not higher biomass though. So it, it wasn't the oasis, despite the highlight availability, maybe needed more time to, to grow. We had a bloom also below the ice because of these leads. And then in the Sun Ocean area, what I didn't show, light availability mainly in the bloom start via ice cover, but not the end. So to summarize all this, uh, these quick highlights of some of our research. The knowledge on these alga responses to this light availability or light conditions is valuable in these times when we have the environmental change happening in the polar areas that affects the light conditions. And then we can maybe guesstimate some more about how the ecosystem responds to the changing light conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanna, for the presentation. And our next and our final talk of this workshop is also with biology. So we continue and we finish with biology. And the next one is going to be about Arctic fungi, given by Leho Ederso from University of Tartu from Estonia. OK, thank you. I'm seeing if I can. OK, I hope you can. Uh, see my screen now. So my name is yes. Leho Tedesno, and uh, I'm from my college and microbiology center of the University of Tartu. So I thank very much uh, the organizers 
for inviting me to talk uh, about my research findings about Arctic uh, fungi. Um, so we have had uh, two projects on uh, Arctic uh, fungi. Both are in collaboration with the uh, Norwegian uh, party or parties. And the last one is also uh, including Latvian and Lithuanian uh, parties. So the first project uh, called Biofun um, lasted from 2013 to 2017. And it was about databasing and indexing of Arctic fungi and also uh, to estimate uh, climate change effects on Arctic fungi. So the um, project uh, started slowly, but uh, eventually it was extremely successful. Uh, as you can see from several papers published in Science and Nature uh, magazines. So we found that uh, Arctic diversity uh, is comparable to other biomes and even exceeds the boreal forests. It may be because of the uh, boreal pine forests are quite homogeneous and, and very acidic. Um, we also found quite surprisingly that the functional diversity of the entire soil microbiome, including also bacteria, archaea and, and fungi, is among the greatest in the world. Uh, comparable to tropical rainforests. Um, when addressing uh, climate change uh, related questions, we found that the strongest effect on soil microbiota comes from vegetation mediated effects. It means that uh, uh, effects uh, of climate change are indirect on soil microbiota and uh, the climate actually affects mostly uh, plants and plants in turn uh, affect the associated uh, microorganisms. Uh, much of our research was uh, performed in, in Svalbard uh, where we performed both uh, field surveys and field experiments. Um, we addressed uh, multiple local and regional scale uh, questions. Um, to our surprise, we found almost no geographical distance effect on, on microbial composition. So the, uh, principally everything was everywhere and dispersal was not limiting the uh, microbes. Um, we also um, manipulated uh, snow cover in, in experiments, but found a very limited and uh, sometimes inconsistent uh, effects of uh, increasing snow and longer uh, melting times. Uh, quite surprisingly, we found uh, strong seasonality effects on soil fungal composition and uh, this you can see on the graph that uh, in the uh, center uh, samples from growing season uh, they are all quite similar but uh, samples uh, before uh, snow melt and uh, after freezing in november they are quite distinct uh, from the uh, growing season uh, samples um, it's very hard to explain this, but it may be that uh, there are certain microbes that uh, still uh, continue uh, their life or that uh, start uh, their active life um, under the uh, snow. Uh, the uh, second project is called SAC. Uh, it's Norwegian, Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian collaboration project with uh, additional parties from other uh, Scandinavian or Nordic countries. It addresses soil carbon vulnerability to global change. Uh, also uh, plant species and plant mycorrhizal type effects on soil carbon retention. Um, afforestation 
or coppicing or early forest growth in uh, uh, Arctic habitats uh, on soil uh, carbon storage. And also, as we have a very nice latitudinal and um, temperature gradient, we studied the biogeography of soil fungi in North Europe. Uh, this summer, uh, or the last summer, was extremely productive for us because labs were closed because of COVID restrictions. And so we could stay a lot of time in fresh air and, and we could sample more than 2,000 vegetation plots uh, for soil. At the moment, the data analysis is ongoing. On the maps to the uh, right, you can see the uh, sampling uh, areas in different countries. Um, when putting these uh, Nordic samples in a, a global context, we also host uh, global soil microbiome uh, project, which uh, covers all the world. And uh, uh, in this way, we had a unique opportunity to put our um, Arctic samples in a global uh, context. Here we were looking for endemicity uh, patterns as, as the first priority. Much of the work is still in progress, but uh, we have found that there is very low endemicity in the boreal and uh, Arctic zone which may be uh, related to the last uh, glacial uh, cycles. Uh, it's also very interesting that the Arctic microbiome is much more diverse than the Antarctic one. But surprisingly, there are very many shared species between the two uh, polar regions. Our uh, future plans also involve a lot of collaboration uh, between the uh, Baltic and Nordic countries. So we are going to uh, map the invasive fungal pathogens of terrestrial plants and also uh, invasive fungal and microeukaryote aquatic pathogens and harmful organisms, mostly in, in lakes with water and sediments. And we intend to seek answer to the question, how do the mostly southern, southern invaders link to natural uh, microbial uh, communities and uh, food webs? So with this, uh, I would like to finish. And I thank uh, many collaborators listed on the left and also financial sources uh, listed on the right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leho, and we thank you for your presentation, uh, which was also the last one uh, of this webinar. Uh, we've successfully came to the discussion section. Um, I know it's hard to uh, have a discussion going in, uh, in a setting like that, and we also considerably ran over time, which is kind of my problem because I um, um, couldn't figure out how to uh, run a online webinar so that everybody can keep their time. But um, not just my problem, I think it's a problem of technology and, 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 and finally we can always play COVID. Uh, so let's play COVID for that. But um, however, I think we have a, a small slot for a discussion among each other and among all the audience. Uh, just for you to know that yeah, right now we have 50, about 50 people online following that session at the moment and at during the peak time, it was about 90 plus uh, visitors at the same time. And um, together, uh, uh, all together, we had about 350, 35 clicks. So I think despite of the um, dire times, it makes a pretty decent, jolly good conference of normal times, isn't it? Um, just to 
to, to have a short discussion between the participants, I would like to give some words for, I don't know, conclusions or options for the organizers or, you know, the masterminds from the both sides of this webinar. Uh, Professor Rain Maitma from Estonian side and Professor Estin Janssen from Norwegian side. So maybe, Rain, if you go first and you just lay out some of your thoughts that we can start put wrapping from. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, everybody, participating in all the presentations and <coughs> uh, listening to this meeting. We originally planned to have a discussion, but <coughs> as you see, and as you know, uh, nowadays, uh, to have a real life discussion in a format we have, uh, I guess uh, maybe it worthwhile to uh, just to suggest to everybody that if you have some uh, urgent questions or suggestions, you can do this if possible, technically. But basically, we are looking forward for next meetings, maybe in June and in September, as <coughs> Ambassador announced in the morning. And uh, just uh, because we had today quite a wide scope of uh, different studies going on on, on Arctic, but uh, for sure, we didn't cover all the disciplines and all, all the important topics. I just thought about the permafrost, genomics, there are other topics, so for the next meetings. And it will be very helpful if you would uh, have some ideas how to uh, have <coughs> the next meetings and what we have to cover. Your ideas would be very welcome, you can send them to Aisten or to me, and uh, when we are starting to put uh, together <coughs> next uh, meetings, we can take this into account, and also uh, it will be very helpful if you got some ideas how to cooperate with colleagues, Estonian colleagues, to Norwegian and vice versa, so uh, all the ideas would be very welcome and, and we try to find the possibilities because we saw there are a lot of common interests and common problems we have to solve. So with uh, this, I conclude from my part here thanking all and uh, looking forward for your ideas and for our next meetings and we'll uh, give word over maybe to Einstein. <laughs> what are your thoughts and to, to on today's meeting and, and what we can, how we can go for the Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Rain, and, and uh, um, I, I would also echo the thank you to everybody who participated and gave interesting and stimulating insights. I, I think the idea of this was to present some sort of, of a, an overview of various strands of research that goes on uh, in our two countries uh, without being uh, exclusive, uh, inclusive of everything that goes on and, and at least my knowledge of Norwegian polar research indicates that the there could be many more, uh, many alternative, uh, just as interesting uh, uh, talks. Um, so, so, um, but uh, what I hope is is that we get some, got some glimpses of what people are doing, what institutions are involved, uh, so that we can start establishing a network. And I think. Uh, uh, for those listening and those who have spoken, uh, ideas on how to organize uh, 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 the next seminar or, or, or rather a workshop that could lead to specific uh, collaborative projects would be, would be the way forward. So uh, ideas on this, um, both in terms of what types of, of collaborations, what types of, of um, uh, work you would like to pursue, which uh, guidance as to where the competence 
sits in the different countries. We have just seen a glimpse of it. So, so, uh, so uh, if you are interested in specific aspects of Norwegian uh, Arctic research, uh, uh, then uh, of course I and others can be of help to guide you to find the right people. So that through that a process like that, we can end up with a with a nice um, program for an, a physical meeting uh, in the fall, which could take the step forward to to developing specific uh, projects. Uh, so with this, I think that would be my, my ambition to get input as to what avenues do you see from presentations here. And also uh, whether you would like uh, engagement or information about other aspects uh, of what's going on that was not presented today. So with those words, I would end from my side. Okay, thank you, Einstein. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if somebody has also questions and actually succeeded to forward those questions or, or ideas before to close the meeting. No, seems it's not the case. So in this case, I once more, I thank all the participants, all the speakers. Thank you, <laughs> Maria. And also, I like to thank our technical team and the team from uh, our Academy of Sciences for providing these facilities and helping to get this meeting through. So thank you very much. Hope and looking forward for uh, our, next, our cooperation in the future and stay healthy. And let's hope that one of the next meetings we can actually organize face by face and to have real discussions. Thank you very much and have a nice time. Thank you. Goodbye.